Hello, it's Jason Heath. I'm coming to you today with a special episode. This is a best of episode from three classic Contrabass Conversations episodes. And back in the early days of the podcast, John Grillo, who's my co-host for dozens of these episodes, especially in the early days, John Grillo and I recorded two episodes that dissected various excerpts. He and I talked through each excerpt, and then we played a recording of John performing that excerpt. And these have been extremely popular over the years, but they've been out over 10 years at this point. And with so many episodes of this podcast and so many new listeners coming on board every week, it's hard to find some of these materials. So bringing these classic offerings to light is really important to me. I've done this in the past, doing these rebroadcasts. I plan on doing some of them in the future. I've done this with some of the classic interviews like Lawrence Hurst, Ed Barker, David Allen Moore, as well as the highlight episodes where we dig through the entire archive and synthesize it into a specific topic like winning the audition, my series, which then became a book, and the jazz basis on business episode I did recently, based in the body and many other topics. And you can find all of these. I've got a special link for all these highlight episodes. It's contrabaseconversations.com slash highlights. So today we're going to feature those two episodes that cover those excerpts. The first one is on orchestra excerpts. The second one's on opera excerpts. I'm going to list of all the excerpts, and there are several on the website, the show notes for this episode. You can check it out at contrabaseconversations.com. And after these excerpts, I'm putting out a conversation that John and I had, again, about 10 years ago, that dissected differences between orchestra-based playing and opera-based playing. John and I talk about some of the differences. I think it's great, especially in the context of listening to all these excerpts. So I hope you enjoy this. It was a lot of fun to put together way back in the day, and I think it's important to bring these back to light and to give new listeners a chance to discover some of this. Sure, you could discover it digging through the archives, but who has time for that, right? So trying to bring some of the real gems, the things that have withstood the test of time, that's what I'm trying to do here with these episodes. So I hope you enjoy. We're going to start with the orchestra excerpt episode, go into the opera one, and then wrap up with our conversation discussing the various stylistic differences. And before we start with that, I would like to thank our sponsor, Diderio Strings. Kaplan Strings is what I've been using the last several months. I love these strings. I'd love to have you get a chance to try them out. We're giving away 10 sets of Kaplan Strings. ContrabaseConversations.com slash strings. You can enter to win a chance at one of these sets. They're designed, engineered, and crafted in New York at the D'Addario facilities. Wonderful strings, great for the bow, great pizzicato strings. Check them out. They're fantastic. I'd also like to thank the Bass Violin Shop. And they offer the largest double bass selection in the Southeast. They've got laminate basses, they've got hybrid basses, they've got carved double basses. And whether you're in search of the best entry-level laminate or a fine pedigree instrument, there's always a unique selection ready for you to try. And trade-ins and consignments are both welcome. Check them out online at BassViolinShop.com. All right, let's get rolling with our orchestra excerpt breakdown from 2007. We're here with double bassist John Grillo. John has been a guest on the podcast many times before. John and I have actually been doing several projects together. We co-hosted an interview with Renan Meyer and one with Lawrence Hurst. And John's been a guest on three episodes of his own. And we've also featured his recital showcase, which is actually the most popular episode in the whole Contrabass Conversations series. So welcome, John. Good evening, Jason. Thanks for having me tonight. Oh, absolutely. And I think folks are really going to be into what we've got for them tonight. We've got uh, something that I don't think it's been done before on any instrument. If it, it, definitely not on bass, and I, I certainly haven't heard it on another instrument. We're actually going to be going through and talking through a lot of the major orchestra repertoire. Now, John has graciously agreed to release these recordings of him playing much of the standard orchestra repertoire. So we're going to be talking a little bit about each excerpt, and then you're going to get a chance to hear it. So I think it's really going to be great. You ready to get going here, John? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, the first 
excerpt we've got up is one of the most popular excerpts, uh, both for auditions and for lessons. And it's one of the it's one of the first excerpts I learned. It's the recipe from Beethoven Nine. What? When did you first start learning this excerpt, John? Was it early on in your bass playing? I think in high school. In high school, yeah, I think me too. I think it was on my first orchestra audition. And what? Why would this excerpt be asked of bass players? What's what's in it that makes it really compelling to to people listening to double bassists? Well, what I remember, I I, I studied with Homer Mensch in, in New York when I was in high school, and what I think makes this excerpt so special is that this is such a famous, like monumental piece as well. So I remember just, it was just great just to play part of Beethoven 9 and then, you know, later on find out that it's a bass excerpt and all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting. This was almost sort of like a repertoire piece for me when I was in high school. So that's, what, that's just, you know, a, mem- a memory that just came back to me. But what I think is so important about this is that it's, it's a very thematic episode as far as bass etudes go. Uh, excerpts, sorry. Um, you know, usually you play a lot of eighth notes, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, very difficult material, awkward string crossings, you know, the, the usual suspects as far as, you know, technical challenges go. But this, re- you know, even the first two notes, A and E, it really lets us, you know, start out very vocally, very powerfully, and, you know, a lot of lyric material. So it's, it's kind of an incredible statement melodically and thematically, I think, which, which it, it, it separates us from a lot of other excerpts. But just a couple of thoughts about this one. It always starts out, you know, the first two notes, you know, up, you know, either up, down, or down, down. So that's just, everybody can make their own opinion about that. Uh, I've played both ways. Um, the music that I'm looking at right now actually has a line and a dot on it. It's one of those. So that's always interesting when you see that. But uh, basically, you know, the, the cellos accompany us when we play this in the orchestra. And it's, you know, another point to point out is that um, is that you could always usually skip the, the hell notes in this excerpt also. There's allegro, man, and troppo, there's a whole, you know, long C sharp. So usually in auditions, that's almost always crossed out. So for bass players out there, when you play this, uh, starting on the third line, you don't have to hold out the C sharp. That's always usually crossed out. That's just another thing you have to worry about. Um, and just remember, you know, as far as tempo always comes to the forefront with this excerpt. So it's a recitative, which, you know, in opera, you know, every conductor has its own way that he does it. I think every bass player or cellist has its own way to do it. So uh, what, what I would say is keep it within a relative ballpark of a steady tempo. I mean, don't get super operatic on it and really, you know, slow down and really soup it up. So. Well, thanks, John. These great comments on Beethoven 9. Here we go with John's recording of the recipe from Beethoven 9.
All right, next up, we've got another one of the major excerpts in our repertoire. We've got Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the third movement, the Scherzo and Trio. Now, this is our second Beethoven excerpt of the episode. John, what what's different about this excerpt? What 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 musically changes in this, and what do you go for when you're practicing and performing this excerpt? The first thing that comes to my mind is that you know, it starts off, you know, on the other side of dynamic spectrum. So it starts off piano or, or pianissimo. I can't remember what. I don't have the music in front of me, but um, and then you know the string crossings. The string crossings is the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, you hear a lot of bass players play this, and those beginning arpeggios, just kind of the C minor. It they, they sound very kind of like their left hand maybe in the right place, but their bow is just kind of not on the right string. So. Uh, just, you know, one general thing I would like to say about this is I think I've played this on every single audition I've ever taken in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> just the bass players out there. So I, I really think even, even more than Beethoven 9. So, um, but, so usually, you know, sometimes bass players also play the second movement. We don't have that here tonight, but, um, it's the Scherzo and Trio, it's the third movement. Uh, then again, this becomes a, just a beginning bowing question. There's up bow, there's down bow. I'm personally more comfortable starting down bow. Um, we're going from lower strings to upper strings. So for me, playing a down bow is a smoother change. So as far as in a, you know, in a solo setting, in orchestra, you know, for me, it goes either way. It's just you know, the principle says up bow, down bow. It's not a big deal. But uh, just a couple of short points to remember. There's the uh, that forte piano. Uh, at, at the end on that D, just that's, you know, every teacher always says just to make sure you, you know, you point that out. Not too much, but make sure that happens. Um, the biggest technical dilemma is the, is the shift to the A flat in this one. So, uh, I remember my first bass teacher told me, you know, the only reason why we play this is to see if you're gonna miss that or not. I said, well, okay. <laughs> But one trick fingering that I've used in the past is that you could just play, I, I usually play third finger A flat to second finger G. You could play this, the G a harmonic. It's a little bit kind of a, you know, kind of a crutch. I and mean, it's a little cheap because it's a harmonic, but that usually makes me kind of just, it, it makes me hit it better. So, uh, otherwise, you know, this is dynamic contrast to the 16th notes, C, E, and, uh, e, C, D, and E flat. So you really want to bring that out. And remember, we're still in Beethoven land, so we can't go into Strauss Mahler on those. I hear bass players play those quarter notes like, you know, super heavy, like gangbusters. So <laughs> just remember, we're still sort of in the classical realm. Um, transitioning into the trio, I would always remember to practice that those eight measures before. I'd always remember, you know, always just playing the pickup C and starting the trio, and then you get to an audition, you know, they always ask you to play the eight measures before, so that's always a good thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, there's repeats on the first section of this. I've played auditions where you play repeats. I've played auditions where you don't, so either way. Um, just going down, there's the, in the second ending, um, just watch those octave Gs. Usually with bass players, those go kind of haywire. <laughs> um, I really just, you know, get really into my like, first finger, fourth finger octave mode big time and have either one of them be right. That's what I always tell my students and match it. So you don't want to get lost in that. You get like octave A flats going. That's no good. <laughs> and then there's always the famous diminuendo. So the pew piano, um, always make sure that that just, that goes down to nothing. And then, uh, you know, by the end of the piece, you know, I really, I try to barely play. But the danger with that is that, you know, you skip or... So don't go too far down where you can't, you know, make the note ring. So now, I totally agree with you with those, about those G octaves right there. Those are one of the most challenging things for me and when I work on this with students. And that that's a great uh, fingering that where you go up to the A flat and then you play the G harmonic. I remember that as soon as I started doing that, I had a lot more success with this. And well, here we go with our recording of Beethoven 5 Scherzo and Trio.
right, next up, we're going to be talking about Brahms, kind of transitioning, moving forward musically uh, to a more modern era. And we're going to be talking about a couple of excerpts from Brahms Symphony Number no. 1. Uh, we're going to be covering Movement 1, and if you want to get out your parts and check this out, we're going to be talking about letter E and letter O. And we're also going to be checking out the fourth movement of Brahms 2. So, John, what now, now that we've moved into Brahms, what changes between Brahms and Beethoven? What do you do differently as a bass player in these styles? I think in Brahms, I think we need a little bit of a, a, a longer, you know, it's a heavier and a longer stroke for Brahms. You know, on all instruments, you always hear Brahms and, and Sustenuto always kind of come together. So um, I tend to think of just playing, you know, kind of longer notes, um, you know, as, as much as possible, especially when you get to some of the off-the-string stuff. So, um, but in Brahms, the interesting thing with Brahms' first symphony is that, you know, it's it's a, it's sort of a slow six-eight. It's not that slow, but it's not, you know, like a scherzo tempo. So tempo in this one, I mean, it's always important tempo, but tempo in this one tends to kind of you know, it, 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 the danger is shifting into a three. So instead of being in a one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, it tends to go one, two, one, two, one, two. Mm-hmm. Kind of a hemiola. And, you know, I would leave that to Brahms because he was a master at hemiola. So I would really and practice this with, with, the, with the triplets going. I think that's very important. You know, two sets of triplets, very definitive. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of dotted quarter notes. Just try to bring those out as much as you can. Um, I think in the Brahms excerpts, people tend to to cut uh, note values. Um, there's you know there's dotted quarters that go into other quarter notes. So I would say longer stroke, you know, more sound, you know, a, a, a bit more strength, but not um, you know roughness at all. Just always mm-hmm. that sustenuto quality. All right. Well, here we go with our excerpts from Brahms Symphony Number no. One and Symphony Number no. Two. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next up, we're going to be moving into even more modern era. We're going to be talking about Shostakovich's Symphony No. 5, the first movement, a very famous bass excerpt, very challenging bass excerpt. So, John, now that we've, we've talked about Beethoven, we've talked about Brahms, how, what, what changes now for us as bass players when we're moving into Shostakovich? What do you do differently? Well, with Shostakovich, now we're, now we're moving into a totally different realm of, you know, lyricism and very expressive playing. So um, this excerpt starts off fortissimo with, uh, I think there's accents all over the place. So <laughs> the first two lines, I think every beat has an accent on it. So um, for me, um, I think in this passage on the second line, this could be somewhat controversial, but I've played the second line you know, up an octave, I think on this recording. Mm-hmm. But I've also played it down my C string. So uh, orchestra, you know, I always play it down. So for me in the past, I, I tend to play stuff up octaves. I mean, not, not extreme, but I've gotten lost trying to do extension stuff in auditions, and it just, you know, it just didn't work for me. That's just for me personally. I have a fingered extension. So um, I've played that for people that love it. I've played that for people that, that hate it. So, you know, be, be that, you know, what it may. Um, this, on the third line of this excerpt, um, really counting really strong 16th notes is important. Um, right before measure 24, because that, that always kind of gets lost. It becomes eighth notes or what have you. And then uh, coming in at 24, a really, really long, you know, legato stroke, you know, as much sound as you can. Um, in this excerpt, you know, I mean, I, I, for this, I really kind of push it. I, I push the envelope. And this has to sound like really extreme. It's extreme romanticism. So, and and also after letter twenty five, there's always kind of a famous uh, a cello rondo, um, into the end of this excerpt. And this is one of the, this probably goes the highest. I mean, out of most bass excerpt, it goes up to a high F. So, um, really work the bowing out. At measure twenty six, I do a I do a hook bowing, which works great. Um. I start, I do the A and the B flat two ups, do a down on the G, then I do an up down on that A, E, and then that puts you in really good shots. And just go up and then just go for it. You got got a whale on this one. All right, here we go with John's recording of the first movement excerpt from Shostakovich 5. up we're going to be talking about Mahler and we're going to be talking specifically about Mahler's second symphony the first page which is a very famous very fun to play a really dynamic and exciting and interesting excerpt for the bass one of my personal favorites for auditions I actually smile whenever I've seen one with this on an audition list so what what are some differences we're talking about two more contemporary composers at least Mahler le- less so than Shostakovich, but what? How would you approach uh, this piece and Mahler in general compared to some of the other composers we've talked about? Especially in this excerpt, I think it's really important that you want to sound like you know the music. And what I mean by that is a very powerful thing that somebody said to me once. They said, you know, the best musicians, you know, hear the chord changes. Like naturally in their own mind. Like that was very powerful for me. I think what they meant by that was that, you know, when you play, especially this Mahler 2 first page, you have to play like, so when someone's listening to it, they hear the orchestra, you know. Mm-hmm. Like this is such a great beginning to it. I mean, it's monumental symphony here. So when I play this piece, I'm almost like, I'm just, I can't help but just like sing the violin memory, uh, melody in my brain. Mm-hmm. 
you know, especially this, especially this excerpt. But that's just, you know, I wanted to mention that tonight. I mean, it's so important to, when you play excerpts to do a lot of listening. You know, go look at the score. Like, you know, if you want a great practice, you know, play it through with a violinist or have a friend play the piano or something like Remember, like, you know, where these came from and that, you know, the, the danger with excerpts is that, you know, you, you play just part of the fabric and you can play an excerpt and it could sound nothing like the symphony at all. I mean, the rhythm's right and all that kind of stuff, but, I mean, it, it, after all the fundamentals are taken care of, you know, the character and the musical gestures become so important, so especially for this. Now, with this piece, you know, and with Mahler in general, I think you always hear, you know, Mahler was a conductor as well as a composer. So um, I remember when I was in Vienna, I got to look at all of his scores. They have, like, a museum there in his office, and all of his music is, like, crazy with all different, you know, colored pencils and, and markings. And, you know, every measure of a Mahler score in his, in his score had, like, 30 different things written into it. Totally incredible. <laughs> Um, but especially on this page, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of dots, there's a lot of dashes, you know, there's dynamics, there's, there's tons of, you know, decrescendos and, and crescendos and all that kind of stuff. So just a couple of specific points. Um, you know, the, the accent on the first two entrances is always a really big thing. Um, for me, the challenge is being, it's, it's really hard for me to make an accent when it's super fortissimo. So perhaps, you know, the next four notes, you know, make the first one the loudest and then, you know, and really just, I think that just becomes both, the, the, you know, the older I get, the more I teach, you know, accents are all just about weight and pressure. So mm-hmm. really grab the string and have it and then get, you know, and then just, just pull it. I mean, really make that, the pressure kind of snap the string. Um, and then the odd tempo is in the second measure. So once you get to that odd tempo and, and that pick up note, I usually play uh, odd tempo. So, just you know, one of the most important and, and tempo. Whenever I've played this in auditions and I've gotten comments and played for bass teachers and colleagues, and, you know, going between the, the you know the sixteenth, you know, the duple rhythm to the triplet rhythm, the triple rhythm is always a huge, huge in this piece. Mm-hmm. So you have to make such a difference between the sixteenth, you know, bum bum bum, the sixteenth note to the da 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 dum bum bum bum. bum, bum really really important so and you and usually you just play the first page here and i i am just playing the tremolo to the forte and i remember i've played this whole thing before so i mean the whole page so just be ready to do the whole thing so you know i totally agree with you on the amount of detail in these Mahler uh, symphonies, whether it's Mahler 2 or Mahler 5, whenever I've worked on this with students, I've just pointed out how my, every bar, these different kinds of accents, different dynamics, and it's so extreme. It's, it's really interesting to look at you know, some of our other standard liter- repertoire, like, like Beethoven or Brahms, and then to just look at how, how Mahler just intensifies the detail and so much more within Mahler. It's great. John, and here we go with John's recording of the first page of Mahler 2.
Okay, next up, we're going to be going back in time. We're going to talk about Mozart, another composer that is basically on every single bass audition. And we've got several excerpts for you from Mozart's Symphony Number no. 35 and 39 that uh, John has recorded. So tell us, John, what are some of the challenges in Mozart, and how did, how did these excerpts differ from Beethoven, Brahms, and some of the other composers we've discussed? Going to Mozart, yeah, I mean, we're really turning back the clock here. Um, so I think in a lot of ways Mozart is probably the the most difficult music to play. I just think in the general repertoire in general. I mean, I've heard every instrumentalist say that. I mean, talk to a flute player, I mean, really good flute players or a violinist or... I mean, there's nothing like Mozart. I mean, he's our, you know, Michelangelo of the music world. I mean, just completely amazing... Uh, stuff here, so uh, you know Mozart. Nobody wants Mozart to be too 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 heavy or too too light. I mean, for bass players, we always you know have to remember to project and everything. But I don't know the character in this always becomes. Uh, uh, when I think of the classical period, I always think of uh, elegance. You know, mm-hmm. you see pictures of those days at the ballrooms and a very sophisticated. Um, Mozart has to sound very sophisticated. I mean, it's. It takes so much, and it's so difficult. I hate saying that, because I hate saying anything's difficult, because it's kind of a blockage, but I almost say that out of respect. Mm-hmm. So uh, Mozart, you know, just, just the Mozart 35, it just, you know, it starts with an octave, and then the trills, and then all the little notes, and then there's all these little 16th notes, and these runs, that just, they just fly by, so... Um, you know, it's kind of an honor to play Mozart in a way. I mean, I always kind of feel honored whenever I play Mozart. I mean, as much as it sort of kicks our butts and stuff. But, um, you know, Mozart 35 is just it's just a bear. So, um, just I'll go back to the first movement in a second. But one of the best practice, um, two practice techniques that, techniques that really helped me out for the last movement. Um, I practice it slurred, which helps a lot. I always think bass players don't do that enough. Violinists do that all the time. They practice the separate stuff slurred and the hard slurred stuff separate. So that that always kind of helps. Plus, I, I I remember just playing practicing this practicing this a lot. Just I, I do like sixteenth notes, a uh, four sixteenth notes on every note, and sort of at, at your at your you know at the tempo you sort of like to be at. So instead of just playing the run, you can go. So that really gets the, you know, the bow kind of honed in, plus the left hand going. So, um, just one thing about the first movement: there's various excerpts that go in the first movement that change drastically. So, and in this recording, I I uh, I have um, I play the notes separate. So there's some conductors that do that. A lot of the Mozart scores and stuff, uh, a lot of you know orchestras in Europe play those separately. So that's just where my mind was with this. So. You know, as usual, I think, well, in, in, in some of the bass orchestral books, I don't want to point out which one it is, but you know, a slur always makes things easier. So <laughs> I mean, It's definitely more difficult, but... As far as Mozart goes, uh, you know, the first movement, also be prepared to, uh, to turn the page, because that, that slurred passage at the top is, is always asked a lot, too, so that's kind of real easy to forget, just focusing on uh, in the beginning of the movement. I think I start the fourth movement, I, I usually start it uh, up bow, too. That was a big difference change for me when I started doing this. I do up bow, and then I hook it again. So I, I, I start the D up bow, and then I hook the A, and then finish down bow. And that, that, that was kind of an interesting... If you want re- to get really fancy, you could play the, the, the D harmonic uh, <laughs> on the D string, which is kind of nifty. Maybe that's kind of more for a concert setting. Mm-hmm. But. And then, you know, this, you know, just a technique. I mean, this stroke on the string has to... Um, and, and just, you know, for especially for the younger players out there, just remember that, you know, when we do... You know, the, we always said the sautier stroke, that's a fancy term for a really fast staccato, but, you know, basically the bow is on the string, and it sounds like it's bouncing. I mean, it is bouncing, but for all intents and purposes, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm dead on the string. Mm-hmm. And then just sort of bouncing the bow. 
with the hair on the string. So I think, and it's a, and I, I'm, I, I always go back and forth where it's, it's an official threshold or if it's personal. So for me, that's about one twelve to the quarter note as far as sixteenths mm-hmm. go. It changes too. I mean, because of, you know, the better equipment I have, I get to kick it up. But very important because, or else, what you get is that you get a very ticky. You get people playing this first, the first, the most of thirty-five, and it's, all you hear is like rosin mm-hmm. ticks. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard that before. It's just that's the date. What I, what I think they're doing is that they're, you know, we think you know spiccato, obviously, you know, like a good like the Brahms and the Beethoven, you know, the bow is way off the string. You know, the strings vibrating, and the hair comes back down at certain angles and all that kind of stuff. But that's very important for this. That's the to me, that's the biggest danger. I think. You know, I th- I think that's that's a great comment about these different kinds of articulation too in Mozart and in Brahms and Beethoven and like how these strokes differ and, and uh, listeners you can notice how John plays these. I, I think it's very very illuminating how he articulates these different excerpts and that's something to keep in mind with these composers. Just what we're talking about. Uh, in some cases, we're talking about you know decades and even hundreds of years between some of these styles, and it's interesting to see how these things change. Well, here we go with our recordings of Mozart 35 and 39 with John.
right, next up, we have a recording of Schubert 9, the third movement, a very popular bass excerpt. A lot of people compare it, actually, to Beethoven's scherzo and trio in terms of in, in, in one in many ways, but it's uh, it's also very different. And John, how how do you approach Schubert's Ninth Symphony, this third movement that we play so often for uh, for auditions and for concerts? Well, for this excerpt, I just pray a lot before <laughs> I start this one. <laughs> At least that's for me personally. Out of most of the excerpts out there, I'm just. I'm going through every prayer, every religion, every spiritual text. So, um, I don't want to be—I don't want to sound discouraging about it, but it just takes a very sort of uh, diligent approach to this to try to work out. It took me a very, very long time, I think, before I—I I didn't know I wasn't playing as well. But this is a very easy excerpt to play, and you think it sounds good, and it, to other people, it sounds not good. I mean. <laughs> The bass players, you know, obviously it's needless to say intonation's an issue, but um, uh, this goes into a D-flat slurred uh, piano arpeggio, um, which is, which is, you know, to me it comes down to what helps me the most, and, um, and you know, we're going to talk about some opera material later, but um, when you have pieces that are in crazy flats and sharps, what I do is, is I take out all the scales that, you know, nobody ever practices enough when they're younger. <laughs> like F sharp major, B major. I remember once with this, you know, for like two weeks, all I practiced once was like D flat major scale and Peggio and, you know, pedal tones and all that kind of And until I really did that, um, you know, it was, it was nowhere. And then, then what you do is you go into a C sharp, uh, C sharp minor mm-hmm. arpeggio. Um, so there's a couple things about starting this. This is another one that's really important to get the stroke going. That's, that's very, very important. Uh, now, it's not as fast as the Mozart, but to make sure all those notes really speak, which is very important. And then um, the danger in this excerpt, too, is, is really playing too loud, mm-hmm. I think. I think you hear a lot of bass players start this, and it's like it's gangbusters. It's like the ring cycle or something. So... Um, you know, just you have to remember, and it's tempting in the Beethoven Trio too. It's, it's just tempting to wail off on this stuff, but you know, if there's an oboe player or a violinist or something, you know, they just play the Schubert, you know, Death of a Maiden or something, or you know, they play mm-hmm. a Schubert, you know, Arpeggioni Sonata or something. You know, it's like it's really you know, delicate, it's still from the classical period. So, uh, what I would say was this: you know, a lot of bar fingerings. I've, I've done a lot of that in the past. Um, I think on this recording, I, I, I reach for those. And I remember once, uh, when I was playing for Edgar Meyer once in the master class at Tanglewood, um, one of the best pieces of advice that could, you could ever imagine for bass playing is, uh, is uh, you know, to really avoid shifting within the slur. Mm. I remember I was playing with him, and I was playing the Vaughn Hall, and you know, I was probably shifting all over the place. I mean, it was, like, insane. I mean, because bass players, we shift every two <laughs> notes, so... I always tell my students from the beginning, uh, the violinist that's on my recording, that's on my recital, you know, he says he could play 36 notes without moving his palm. So <laughs> I said I do two and shift. So. So, what, so for me on this one, what I do is it really let the ink be your guide as far as where you shift, I think. If you have to shift every measure, it may seem a little blockish or kind of awkward, but it makes the bow, you know, really, you know, then the bow could just shift through the string crossing and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So it's just an exercise that takes a lot of attention. This, now, this is a perfect example of, you know, slow practice and separate practice. You know, I remember what I like to do with this excerpt and a lot of other excerpts is I just put on, you know, maybe 76 or 86 or something like that, and I just play it in quarter notes, you know, just separate legato quarter notes. And just remember, let her be, I've always had, uh, you know, auditions, comments, and teachers and everything, like, you know, there's sforzandos and all of those, too, so. That's always important to bring out. Like, in the fourth measure, there's a sforzando on that E, so. That's a great Ed, Ed Barker, I remember when I was at Tanglewood, just, you know, you know, studying with Ed Barker and stuff, he, he always said, you know, that nobody plays accents. Like, you know, you know, totally right. 
in an orchestra, it's true. You know, when accents come in orchestra, it's like it's, it's the easy, it's the easiest thing to look over. But I really think the composers want us to do that. So well, that's great advice for this very di- difficult, deceptively difficult excerpt. Uh, here we go with our recording of John playing the third movement of Schubert Nine. Next up, we're going to move into the modern era again with uh, an excerpt that's very often requested of bass players. We're going to be talking about Benjamin Britten's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, the double bass variation for this piece. Now, moving into the modern era and talking about this, this is a very interesting and very different piece from everything we've talked about tonight. Uh, what are some of the challenges in the Young Person's Guide, John? The first thing most people are going to talk about is the... Uh probably early glisses up to the higher notes. Uh, you know, there's octave G, so it's one gliss that goes from, you know, op- open G string, you know, to, to um, you know, the half string harmonic. Then there's one that goes up to the octave above that that ends the piece. So just a couple of thoughts about that, because that always seems to kind of come up as an issue. Um, I've always, you know, sort of heard both ways. I think what I do is I take kind of a, a middle approach, I kind of start after, you know, I play, I play the note, then I kind of start sliding. And, you know, some people slide right from the beginning. Some people wait and slide closer to the end. So when you play this in a, you know, in an orchestra setting, you know, the conductor usually kind of clears that up. But what I do with the harmonics is I think, and with harmonics in general too, is that, especially with bass, and I, I'm teaching this more and more too, that we definitely don't use enough bow on harmonics, I don't think. Mm-hmm. So what I tend to do is I make sure I really have enough bow on the harmonics, and then I really just give it like a super whirl. I mean, just you got to really go for it because you hear a lot of bass players play this, and it goes and it goes up to the top, and it just kind of like ends. <laughs> I don't know if the bow slides or and there's this, you know there's a crescendo to his fourth tondo on it, and the fourth tondo on the last one. So you know this really goes up to the top, and then and then just go for it. So. Um, but to, you know, then again, we have this, you know, like in the Mahler, or, uh, you know, we have this, you know, the line and the dash. So that puzzled me for many years. Um, what I deduced from that in my professional career is I, that's probably just a pretty, like, you know, you know really good detaché stroke, I guess. I mean, I think it's, you know, not too short, not too long. So it's not legato, it's not staccato. So that's how I teach detaché to my students. So, you know, then then you're not on either side of the equation. So if you play staccato and then you play legato, and you're somewhere in the middle, you know, then it depends on the bass. I don't know. There's, you know, if you have an Italian bass, you know, it's really boomy and stuff, and you kind of have to tone down. But you know, if you have a bass that you really have to push out, I don't know. It just may have to be a little bit of a longer stroke. Um, you know, this this gets kind of harmonic. That same kind of harmonic insanity. Let's see. Um, End of the first line, it's kind of crazy. Usually that, that's, that's a really big intonation dilemma uh, in those spots. Um, uh, just make sure you count uh, the measures in between um, for this, the second line. Oh, and then, you know, just, just, just a point about, you know, when we get to play the orchestra solos, 
for bass players, this is such an opportunity. Like for me, I always take a kind of a deep breath and I'm like, oh, I'm glad all that staccato stuff's <laughs> done. I mean, here we go. You know, we have a you know a beautiful you know melodic section here. You know, I mean, it, it sounds much better with one person than the nine bass players with seven bass players at a <laughs> tune. But that's I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that at another time. So. <laughs> I play this sometimes where this is like this is like you're playing like you know Perez or something. <laughs> uh, other other than that, um, uh, you know, there's the swells in the middle, the forte. Always kind of remember that. Um, you know, then there's the third line before the sonata. That you know, in a classical setting, that's always in a classical orchestra setting. Um, that's always a pretty big rollantando there, and then hold that fermata. And usually, I do a like. A loose pause are there like a break, and then, and then they're back to pianissimo again. So, now bowling wise, I've done different things. I think the last time I played this, I, I, I can't remember. I, I played it two ways. I've alternated the bowlings, and then I've, I've started up every time. So, if you alternate the bowlings, just make sure it's equal. So, and just with the bottom G scale, I, I just do a it, it, coming down. I do a real sort of classic bass player G major scale. Four one four one four one. I don't know. To me, when I have to play a fast G major scale, that's nothing that works better than that. So, because bass players are already on the G with a three. I don't know. I've seen a lot of bass players and just do two four two four. Then then you're at four shifts there. So, yeah, so you have four shifts compared to. Well, you have to go to the F sharp, but I don't really count. You know, you're off the harmonic already. So, the big thing with this, the gliss is just just go off for the go off for the harmonics. And really make sure you have a lot bow and just, and then to me too, those harmonics never started coming out until I really made sure that I was pushing on the string for the harmonic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so tempting to go up and then just, you know, your strings kind of lazily on the string. Now I don't mean, I don't mean moving the string, but you know, push the string as hard as you can without moving the string. And to me, and with, and with harmonics with lots of bow, I mean, even, you know, you know, Kick up the speed and uh, relax the pressure on that. So, yeah, that's great advice about this excerpt. This is, is virtuo oddly virtuosic excerpt. I think a lot of people have a hard time interpreting this excerpt. So, really, those are great, great tips for for bassists out there. Oh, here we go with John's recording of Benjamin Britten's Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, the double bass variation. Next up, we're going to be talking about one of the major composers asked on double bass auditions, along with Beethoven and Mozart. I think I, I can probably count on one hand the amount of auditions that haven't had this composer, and that composer is Richard Strauss. We're going to be talking about Ein Heldenleben. So, John, we've talked about many composers, Beethoven and Brahms, Shostakovich, Mahler, Mozart... Schubert, uh, even Benjamin Britten. What what's different about Strauss? How do you approach Strauss as a bass player, and how do you approach Ein Heldenleben as a piece? Well, that's a that's a good question. I think there's there's many thoughts on that. I mean, there's so many different ways to go with Strauss because um, and you know what? I have to say, uh, this number nine for Ein Heldenleben, I think, is almost pretty much up there with Beethoven five. Um, this is bringing back a lot of crazy memories of, of just playing those two. I mean, I think that's sort of that sort of like it's a perfect prelim exactly. for people. Uh, I think I've done that uh, many times, and you know, and this just came to my you know just my thoughts. It's like you know one of the challenging things about auditions and for for you know people of any age is that you need you have to prepare you know kind of you know these amazing amounts of material. You know, these lists just get bigger and bigger and 
you know, pretty soon they'll just have a list that'll say <laughs> everything. You know, who knows? But you know, it usually really comes down to like these nuts. You know, you'll have a list. You'll have thirty excerpts on a list. You know, and you'll practice two months and make all these books. And, and I'm not saying that all the other material is not important, but you show up to the audition, and it's just Beethoven five, number nine on Helden. I mean, it's it's incredible. Now that's just for you know in the beginning rounds. You know, when you get you know up later, you know, you go into all different kinds of stuff. So, um, just just a point about that. And you know what? The best way to look at all this stuff, I think, is that, you know, if you have to practice all this Mozart and Schubert, and it, you know, it really, it, it challenges us to the extreme here. I mean, I think some of these, you know, this is, they pick this stuff for a reason. Um, it's just great practice. So if you go to an audition and you practice for two months, I mean, if you didn't take the audition, you know, what else would you be doing? So, I mean, I remember practicing, you know, all of Ein Held Eleven for an audition, you know, and perhaps just playing, you know, you know, one or two spots and, you know. There's not that much time when you're in, you know, with orchestras and auditions. So. But just that said, that's important because I just always remember, you know, putting so much energy into Eindhoven Leben and, you know, you don't get to play, you know, the whole battle scene. But it doesn't matter because next time you play it, you know, it's just going to be that much better. So, um, but that said, um, yeah, so the most, pretty much I think the one I've played the most in this is, is number nine. That's the famous, you know, bass player passage. So we have some uh, very challenging, uh, Arpeggios here, um, and in terms of where to stop, uh, sometimes you go past eleven in this piece. Um, sometimes, usually, the cutoff point. I think where I stop in this is uh, right after number eleven. So, um, and as far as you said, you know, just character-wise with Strauss, uh, you know, now we're back into that sort of. I wouldn't say as you know, with Russian composers, the Shostakovich, you know, all those guys. It seems like it gets really, um, you know, extreme. I think this is, I would say this is extreme romanticism with still sort of like, you know, a really, really nice sound and not really pushing it that much. So I think the danger with bass when we play loud excerpts is that we tend to overplay. It's starting to become very obvious to me. The more I teach and, you know, the more I get to hear people play. Oh, absolutely. You think so, Jason? I mean, you hear people start number nine, and I think this when I was younger, I would start number nine, I'd be pushing so hard, it's like my bow's not even my Yeah, oh, I would be so into the string, it'd be against the fingerboard, and I would be like, yeah, as as loud as I could possibly play. Yeah. And probably on bass, I, I just remember one another great uh, advice I got once, is, you know, someone told me, like, you know, we always overplay our instruments, you mm-hmm. know. Like, you know, if you have an instrument that could take it, then do it. But, I mean, just be really careful about that because I think on bass it becomes counterproductive. So so just just a couple of specifics about this number nine. Um, the, so, you know, the, the discussion always becomes, you know, to play a closed A or a harmonic A in Ein Heldenleben. So I've always played the harmonic. I have friends that, you know, always play the... Um, Solid A. I don't know what you do, Jason, but that seems to kind of yeah. I think people point. find different ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, but you know, just the important thing in this, what I tend to practice, and I, 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 to this day, I still try to clean this stuff up. I mean, I try to. You have to. These arpeggios just have to be kind of as smooth as possible. So then, just again, back to sort of separate practice. Um, the measure, the, the last note right before the last measure, before ten, uh, just that high C always tends to be clipped. I mean, that's always kind of on the shorter side. People always like that to be as long as possible. Um, number 10 is a dynamic change. That's always a big thing that people always forget. So, um, and you know, and sometimes more than just brute force, you know, I mean, obviously, I, you know, Strauss is very strong and powerful and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, sometimes, you know, just bringing out the dynamic like that is, you know, Especially in audition settings. So, I mean, if this is if this is the orchestra, I mean, this is total gangbusters here. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is Roz and flying all over. You know, the bridges are falling <laughs> off. I mean, this is just fun. This is going crazy. So. But you know, to me, you know, remember, so you know, in auditions, you know, it's solo. It's kind of amazing because we're in an industry where, you know, you join an ensemble based on like a solo experience. It's kind of incredible. You know, for some orchestras, it backfires. I mean, people can't read music and different kinds of stuff. But, um, so just remember, you know, you're by yourself. It's a solo presentation. So bring out the characters of all this music. You know, those fourth sound before 
uh, 11 are always very important. I tend to go to the lower octave before 11, but that's just me. To me, that kind of sounds... You get the bass players listening to you. Kind of <laughs> Everybody loves when you go low, so just like your show. So Now, there's, you know, there's, then there's, what's, you know, kind of amazing about on Hellblame is that there's plenty of other spots besides mm -hmm. number nine. So I think what else do we have here? We have a, a 49, which is this kind of B major section, which is very difficult, I think. I hate to say that, but challenging is always the best word because it doesn't get in the way. You know? And never think these things are hard. That's important. I remember somebody told me that once. That the subconscious mind doesn't react as hard as, like, shuts you down. It's like challenging means that, like, you're going to be able to do it. So it's very important. So always look at these things as challenges instead of being hard or even difficult is a bad word. I shouldn't oh, use yeah. that, but you know what I'm saying. We have number 49. There's, there's plenty of slow passages, which are very, very exposed. But they're quite beautiful, though. I mean, they're very, you know, challenging, but it's... I think I, I don't have the music in front of me, but I, 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 is, it, is it 10 or... Right, there's... Yeah, there's... I don't know, maybe... maybe yeah, there's several of slow excerpts, and yeah, they're beautiful excerpts. Very interesting. It's, it, you know, if you just practice number 49 or number 9, and then you, you get faced with one of those, it's like a... It's, it's a very different set of, of hurdles to just try to overcome. And then you have the battle scene, <laughs> which is like, you know, it's exactly what it is, so... Um, it's great. I mean, there's plenty of pads. I mean, it's just it's great. I think the one that I play, it's the number is escaping me now, but 61, something like that. Um, then you play through the whole battle scene. There's you know there's some there's that uh you know, the A flat section. You know, tons of slurs with you know so just picking really efficient fingerings is important for that and and keeping and the, the thing with the battle scene and the bowling is that there's you know. You know, there's different up bows and down bows, so I, I would say keep it consistent. So I remember trying, you know, some different bows for that, but I think, let's see, what do I do? Uh, you know, you could either do a retake and then do as comes, or then there's like, you know, there's, a, there's two up bows, but, so I don't have the music in front of me, but mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. And then it, you always usually end up with, uh, then there's always 77 too, which is a great moment. It's a great bass, bass line too, so. It's really sort of like, you know, like the climax of the whole piece, you know, string unison. So I always try to keep that in mind. It's like string mm -hmm. unison. So um, then again, that's another example of just keeping, you know, the orchestra piece going on in your brain wh wh while you play the excerpt is really like conveys to the listener, I think. You, know, you don't have to be singing it out and stuff, but I mean, really put yourself in, in the middle of the that sort of symphonic sound, and it really translates through the excerpts. Don't oh, you think, yeah. Jason? I mean, it's it's and some people. I think you know some of the people too. That it's a quality that musicians have. It goes back to that point before. You know, the best musicians. You know, really like you know they, they just kind of naturally hear the chord changes. Like it's it just sounds the way it sounds. So. No, I compl I completely agree. You know, this is this is a great this is the piece that I use to uh put fear into the hearts of my students. I'll take the part out sometimes in lessons and I'll say, "Well, you think that D major scale is hard? Yeah, check out what we have to do." And so it's great. Well, uh with that in mind, uh, take a listen to these excerpts from Einheld Leben featuring John Thank you. 
this episode tonight with uh, with a piece that will actually serve as a bridge to the the next project that John and I are, are have in mind. Uh, we're going to be talking right now about Verdi's excerpt from Otello and. It's, this is the first opera excerpt we've talked about, and so the, John has played a great deal of opera. I've also played a lot of opera myself, and it's it's very interesting. And I think I think it'll be very interesting to explore some of the differences between this orchestral repertoire that we've talked about with the Beethoven and Brahms and Shostakovich and Mahler, and then to get into opera music. And you know, many of those composers we mentioned also wrote operas too. So. With that in mind, John, what are some of the challenges in this this very famous bass soli from the fourth movement of Verdi's Otello? Oh, there's many challenges here, but um, the first one that comes to my mind is that, well, I, I think intonation, for me, has been the biggest challenge on this. I mean, you know, you know this is, you know, obviously, you know, there's always, uh, you know, what, there's, there's, the, there's the three pillars of... Um, audition playing so you know it's in time which means you know the tempos are right you know it's in tune which means you know, intonations you know, is, you know is spot on and then you know then with a good you know healthy sound with really good character and stuff but you know that, that said i think for me just you know the intonation of this and i think it really comes from even just the fact that when we read music that has flats in it you know one of the biggest things that helped me out once was that somebody said you know think in terms of sharps like for me, that just that changes this excerpt around, turns it on its head. Because instead of playing a G flat, I don't know, F sharp is like if you tell a bass player to play an F sharp out of nowhere, they could pretty much nail it. Mm-hmm. I think. So that's just sort of a little mental trick. But and same thing with the C flat. I mean, I just struggling with that in the past when I just sort of thought just you know be natural. Just kind of helps. I mean, that's just a, a mental thing. So, um, but otherwise, you know. As we transition into this opera material here, um, hopefully we talked about this much in the other with the other excerpts, just how character is so important. Um, it always comes to the forefront in opera, but it's probably just as important, you know, in on Helden Leben and Schubert and Trio of Beethoven. You know, is getting just the true is the right character of the music. So, you know, as we transition into opera material, you know, maybe it's because of the stage and, um, you know, and you think, you know. The, this is an extremely you know, dramatic part in the opera. It's Act Four. I think um, isn't he contemplating? Uh, exactly. King? Yeah, his wife. Uh, I can't. I can't remember the characters, but I mean, so this guy he's walking around the stage with a knife in his hand. I mean, it sounds like a lot of oboe players. But, um, so, 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 so he's he, he's walking around. You know, it's a crazy person like deciding to kill somebody. So if that, but you know, the important thing is you know getting the mood of the piece piece right. So um, just a couple points about this. Um, the mute, you know, either Cohen Sardino or Senza without a mute always becomes... Um, I, I've done it both ways. So sometimes in front of a conductor they say, oh, no, you know, forget about it. You know, it just depends. I mean, so what I would say is be ready with that. And another suggestion is that practice with the mute on. So don't practice it at home and then all of a sudden go to the audition and put the mute on. Because for me, you know... Somehow I think the mute, I mean, it almost kind of, everything's a little bit on the flat side in a way with the mute on, I think. At least that's the way I hear it. Um, so, and, you know, and then really, you know, the very smooth string crossings become very important. Um, counting the rests in this becomes very important. Bass players always kind of space <laughs> out. Uh, not really the three, four, but it, it, or even there too, they play, dum instead of three, four. But it kind of goes on for about this kind of a nebulous measure or so. So I would always I would always watch that, and especially after V. So now I usually play with with the you know there's the upo uh, I mean the three uh, portato E flats. I play the first. Let's see, one, two, three. I play up upo. And even though there's you know it's it's a slur with it's a portato, I would definitely keep some length to those notes. I think that's a danger with some bass players. It tends to sound like eh, eh, eh. It's you know real staccato. It's like a, it's misrepresentation. So I would definitely keep that. I, I now I think just portato. So 
and then before the high shift to the B flat, I separate those. So I go up, up, down, up, with with as much crescendo as you can. So, just remember the swells. I mean, two measures before V. That's a huge um, diminuendo there. I think every time I play that, I, I, I criticize myself for not demean, be, uh, getting soft enough. So Now, it's still an audition setting, so you can't, you know, just dip out. But see, it says, and it says morendo. That means, you know, totally to nothing. So, uh, you know, morendo, that's close to death. So morire in Italian is to die. So that just means just to sound just to die out and fade out. So Now, for the last two lines of this, there's some different interpretations. So there's... I, I, for some reason, for me, I tend to not to do the cello round. Well, maybe I, I can't remember now. I have to listen to the recording, but I can't remember the way I play it. But I remember just kind of experimenting with that. Um, but the important thing is to try to keep piano if you can. So, um, and then as far as the eighth notes go, you know, if, if the rest of the orchestra comes in. I think is it the is it the sixth note? No, 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 no. It, it's it's beat three. It's it's the second sixteenth note of beat three, and in my part here, it all has mm-hmm. accents on it. So, just remember at that point. Now here again. Now it's as far as the, the fingering goes. Where the sixteenth notes start, you know, you could stay on the string. You could either go up the A string or come down. So, I, I've done it both ways. So. And just remember to finish with just three really nice notes. That's another thing. Bass players play this whole thing, and then they end with three notes. <laughs> <laughs> but just, you know, very beautiful sound. I think that's very important in this, this sound, too, this very sound. And intonation pretty much, I mean, um, as far as tempo goes, you know, it kind of clicks along until I have a rondo at the end, so... I have to check my part. I, I'm I'm looking at a part here that I don't usually use. I think that a chill around though may be in the wrong spot, so I don't want to definitive, definitively say where that is. But you get you get what I'm saying. Absolutely. And you know, it's it's interesting what you were speaking about earlier with with the sharps and flats. I I did the same thing myself, and I've given that advice to people to just think. You know, it's sort of C flat. C flat just conjures up fear in the mind of bass players because we never play it. But if you just say B, it's it's and and those last three notes, yeah, it's amazing how often people can get through and they can just play these just three little thuds and just that's you know a moment that <laughs> it can be very tough to uh, to nail effectively. Plus, with all this stuff, it's usually the hard stuff is mm-hmm. what people play great, and then the easy stuff is when our mind kind of checks out and we're like. You know, I, I, you know, I'm glad I'm finished. You know, whew, it's sort of like I'm glad that's over. But I love Otello, though. I love Otello. This is one of the first piece, play, uh, pieces I think I played. I think I started playing this in ninth wow. grade, which is crazy. I, w- I was at a music camp, and it's very interesting. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how I feel about you know super young people playing ex- playing excerpts because. I mean, it's great one, on one aspect. It's great that young people do it, but then on the same, you know, we end up. I don't know. I, I, I like to have it just in, it, it, in the right time of development. So, you know, I won't. I won't. I don't want my ninth grade students playing on Helden Labens because that's just. I don't think that's mm-hmm. that's just my way. But you know, unless they can handle it, if they can play it, then you know, go for it. But it was interesting. You know, like just like with the Beethoven, like these were just introduced as as orchestra pieces, and I mean, it was great. This was just like a solo piece at this music camp. So they said, just play this. So I was like, okay, great. So I also think it's in the back of the Samandel book, too, so that probably helps. So. I think it's a very healthy way to introduce orchestra excerpts, like you were saying. Just think of it as a solo piece. This is like a component. And, yeah, not too early. I, I think that, yeah, it's, I definitely agree. I try to not start students on these sort of pieces until they're ready, so... Well, John, it's really been a pleasure to to do this episode. I think I'm sure that listeners have really gotten a lot out of this, and I I, I can't wait to get together and do this again, and where we're going to cover some opera excerpts. Thanks so much, John. All right, folks, here we go with our last excerpt from the evening. This is Verdi's Otello, based solely from Act Four. Thank you. 
that's our orchestra excerpts breakdown episode. It ended right there with the Verity. And we got a great response putting that out 10 years ago. So many people wrote in and commented about how helpful it was to go through the excerpts like that. And I hope you found it useful. It's cool. It's fun to listen back to these uh, earlier projects. And I really think it was valuable what we were doing. So we're going to move on and get into the opera excerpt breakdown episode. Here it is. Well, we're here with double bassist John Grillo, who you know from both DoubleBassBlog.org and ContrabassConversations.com. Uh, John's been our most featured bassist on the podcast. We've had his recital showcase, our orchestra excerpt breakdown, three interview episodes, plus John has been our co-host for several episodes, uh, including interviews with Lawrence Hurst, Renan Meyer, and Owen Lee. Uh, how are you doing, John? Jason, I'm doing great. Well, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Well, I th- I'm really excited for the program today because John has performed much of the opera literature in a variety of different companies, including the Pittsburgh Opera, the Sarasota Opera, and the Spoleto Festival in Italy. In addition to his bass playing activities, John also authors a blog, which you can find at classicalmusicnews.tv, where, dis- where John discusses some of the issues of the day. So, John, really excited for this. You want to get going here? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, we are going to start by talking about Richard Strauss. And uh, we've got a few excerpts for you today. We're going to be hearing some music from Salome and Rosencavalier. So folks who haven't heard our orchestra excerpts breakdown may want to check out Contrabass Conversations number 41, where we discussed several of the major composers of orchestra literature that you find on bass auditions and the like, and one of the composers we discussed was Strauss. So tell me, John, uh, what differs between Strauss's orchestral writing and his opera writing? Well, that's quite a question, but <laughs> as, <laughs> as far as it, as it pertains to these two excerpts, what, what, what I would say is um, the first one we're going to hear tonight, Salome, does start um, with three Fs, which is, which is a, you know, extremely loud passage so what i would say the 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 connection is it's a lot of it's a lot of loud playing with sort of that you know that typical um phrasing where there's you know know, there's lines over multiple measures Mm -hmm. so you're still changing your bow down to up but it's still these sort of long lyrical you know fortissimo passages so i mean with tons of accidentals and uh, you know, many difficult shifts, and so I guess there's, I guess there's a lot of more similarities and differences. So, um, just one thing I wanted to mention about, you know, when you go to take an opera audition, um, for me, the opera auditions I've taken in my lifetime have been extremely refreshing, because uh, what happens is that usually the opera companies send you the music, and these are all the pieces that we, we, you know, we're so used to studying standard repertoire in music school, you know, and playing ad nauseum, all the excerpts. So you really get to delve into some new, you know, some of these pieces. When I first started practicing them, were completely new to me, which was just really cool and refreshing, you know, mm-hmm. to kind of do, do fingerings for the first time, bowings, go to the library, get the recordings, you know, listen to them, you know, look at the score. Oh wow, what's this? So. So to me, I just wanted to throw that in before we start, just how refreshing an opera audition could be. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, now, with this, with this Salome, I think what happens in, in this story, if I remember correctly, is that this passage comes right after John the, Bapti- John the Baptist is beheaded. So I can never get that out of my head before I start playing this. So. <laughs> um, but just as four sharps, it's just, there's one, there's a killer um, lick towards the end that you'll hear, so... Um, but other than that, yeah, let's, let's just hear it. All right, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from Salome. Thank you. 
our next excerpt on the program is an excerpt again by Strauss, this time from uh, the opera Rosencavalier. So tell us a little bit about this excerpt, John, and about uh, Rosencavalier as a piece. Well, this, this excerpt, um, it starts off piano. And in this excerpt, the biggest, the biggest red flag is that there's uh, piano string crossings which I remember just practicing a ton and just, it's, it's, it's quite difficult uh, with many sharps and flats too. So, I mean, then again, with all these Strauss excerpts, it's almost like, you know, a lot of B major, you know, a lot of, um, you know, E flat, D flat, G flat kind of stuff that we're sort of not used to playing. So just a practice, practice technique for these two that just, you know, practice the slurred stuff separate, you know, and a lot of the separate stuff slurred too. So, I just remember with this excerpt, it just took me a long time to feel comfortable. Yeah, this is such a wonderful piece to play. It's a very challenging piece. You know, I, I had the opportunity to play this uh, with the Lyric Opera of Chicago, and I, I remember that was one of the, 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 you know, it's a very long opera, and just being astounded at the amount of endurance it takes to just get through a piece like this. It's so different from playing even a Strauss tone poem, which is very demanding, but to you know, be on your game for four, or five, even six hours for some operas. I think it's a really different skill than what you normally have to do for the orchestral world. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from Rosen Cavalier. <laughs> Next up, we're going to be transitioning into music from Richard Wagner, major figure in the opera world. And uh, most of the music you play, even in an orchestral setting by Wagner, in fact, everything is from an opera. So a composer that even if you don't play a lot of opera, you've probably played some material from. So tell us a little bit about the music of Wagner, John, and what it's like preparing some of these excerpts from uh, Die Meistersinger and Valkyrie. Well, I still remember the first day when I opened to this page and looked at this excerpt, and I was like, "Oh no!" <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really, I was really scared. My, my, my first reaction was just retreat. That was, I never saw it before. Uh, this, this is a, this is just one that you know, most of the page is just black. <laughs> so, uh, you know, tons of sixteenth notes, you know, tons of accidentals. Um, it transitions from a two-four passage into a three-four. Uh, which is tons of accidentals and uh, you know, a, a quite challenging uh, you know, lick at the end that goes you know, sharp to natural to sharp and all that kind of stuff. So, um, Just remembering, uh, I think you know, so many barred barring became so important with a lot of these passages. So, um, and you know, playing like an E, E, E sharp, F you know, on the A string. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, sort of closer, you know, to to the mid mid range harmonic. So, you know, really being just all over the fingerboard and this kind of stuff. Um, I, I just remember that because I, I wrote in, you know, tons of brackets and that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. um, I just remember being, wow, well, you know, this is this, but you know, just take it slow and learn it and stuff. And um, yeah, that was that's it. All right, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from De Meister Singer. Thank you. 
we've got one more excerpt from De Meister Singer for you here. And tell us a little about this excerpt, John. Well, this, this excerpt comes uh, from Act One. So I don't know if we mentioned that um, the previous excerpt is from Act Two. I mean, just for you know, catalog purposes. Um, this one was one of my favorite excerpts that I've ever opera excerpts that I've ever played. So it's piano, it's dolce, um, it's it's really really beautiful, and this is a great one to play, uh, you know, for some other people. So then again, you know, we're so used to you know playing so much spiccato passages and stuff that's just really really you know takes a lot of you know technical work and stuff, and uh, and this one is just so smooth and legato and. And, 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 and what I love is that, you know, there's so many passages that go up and it has a crescendo and then after it reach the top note of the phrase, it comes over and then it diminuendos down. And then, so you really get to, you know, that sort of bel canto arc. So, you, you know, it's just, it's just great. So, you know, just like the tenors on stage. So. Now, this, this is an opera that is incredibly long in duration. You've had the opportunity to play this opera, haven't you, John? I've never played Der Meister Oh, you've never played Der Meister I, You know, I know at the... I've, I've never had the opportunity to, but I know at the Lyric Opera uh, here in Chicago, this is one of those sort of, you know, you have to really steal yourself. I think it's a solid six hours for this one, if you play it. So that's something to think about when you play your hour-and-a-half orchestra concert, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, here we go with this next excerpt from Der Meister Singer. Mm. Right. Next up, we've got another couple of selections from Wagner, this time from Die Valkyrie. And, John, I understand that you've actually performed a chamber version of, was it the entire ring cycle? Yeah, uh, we did uh, in Pittsburgh in the, t- in the summer of 2006. Wow. Yeah, the o- Opera Theater of Pittsburgh, uh, and mostly Pittsburgh opera musicians. It was sort of this you know, special summer um, project that was put together. Um, and then, and it was by myself too. Which, <laughs> when I first got the call from that, I was kind of, you know, I was really excited from the beginning. But just, you know, just you know, looking at these excerpts again, you know, when I was playing this, it just, you know, these two excerpts, so much of that piece is just exactly like this. So, I mean, it was just a stretch of all imaginations. So, I mean, and it just goes on and it goes on and it goes on, and it's just amazingly obsessive. I think. I don't know. I just. That was a wonderful experience, but especially in the Valkyrie, I just remember because, you know, in the concert, I just remember thinking, you know, this is so similar to the excerpts we usually play for opera auditions, and it's just, you know, stuff that doesn't feel good a lot of times. I mean, you just have to just do it. So um, then again, just back to, you know, the bracket, you know, to try to get, you know, as many notes in one position as you can and just play notes across the string, you know, if if, if it works right. So, and... uh this, uh, there's there's two sections to this um, excerpt. We're just going to play them back to back. But um, there's that one shift that goes up to a you know G sharp. So that's that's a really tough passage there. So, but otherwise, you know, you just have to you know play sustained when you can, and you know when you have to play short, just remember to play short. All that kind of stuff. So it's great music, though. I mean, just so much fun. Oh, it's fantastic music. Yeah. All right, well, here we go with John's recording of these excerpts from De Valkyrie. Thank you. 
right, next up, we're going to be moving forward into the 20th century with some music from Benjamin Britten and his opera Peter Grimes. And this is quite a challenging excerpt. I've had the opportunity to work this up and play it for a few auditions myself. Uh, tell us a little about this excerpt, John, and about Peter Grimes. Let me see. I, it must be more than 10 years ago, but one of, uh, my summer in, 2000, in 1995 at Tanglewood, um, I was lucky enough to be there. And we played a, a 50th anniversary concert um, of Peter Grimes, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, anybody that was there and was part of that was just, so to this day, so many people that were there that summer, you know, really think that it's, it was the best concert we've ever been in. So Seiji Ozawa was conducting. He did the whole opera from memory. Which wow. Was, <laughs> it was thousands of pages, yeah. And we did four performances in a row, you know, four nights in a row. And I think he made, like, one mistake in dress rehearsal and one mistake, which was totally amazing. I mean, he was he was meditating in between acts, and he said it was the second most important concert of his life after uh, his debut, filling in for Carry On or something. To- total, totally out- outstanding. So it was just incredible. Um, Anthony Dean Griffey was Peter Grimes. Now he's the big Peter Grimes at the Met and all over the world. And in the audience, it was Beverly Sills, and it, it just goes on and on. So, wow. um, which is really a special experience, and, and just a fan, and just a fantastic piece. But um, I do remember playing this one in the orchestra. I mean, this is so. This is six flats. <laughs> so it starts up G flat, goes up to um, you know B flat in some positions. So. Just a lot of just try, trying to zone in and stay on the right, you know, pitches and stuff like that. So this is a very challenging excerpt, very challenging excerpt. So, you know, one thing so far, I mean, we're not getting in as in-depth with these excerpts as the other one, just because, you know, an opera, I think there's just so much more material. We were talking about that before we started tonight, you know. I mean, this is like a four-hour work or so. But what, one thing I'm not, you know, you can notice in all these excerpts is that they're, it, they're so thematic in a way, you know, there's, there's such... Maybe, you know, since it's operatic, there's so much more, you know, sort of a, even if it's technical, it's very lyric and very, uh, you know, very lyrical quality to all this. So that's always kind of fun to think about when you work on these. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. It can be a real contrast with some of the other orchestra excerpts that we typically play for auditions. So, Well, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from the great opera Peter Grimes. up, we've got some music from the great Italian 19th century composer Verdi. We're going to be starting with his opera Otello, and we've actually featured this particular excerpt from the fourth act on uh, episode 41, our orchestra excerpt breakdown. A lot of the time, you're asked for this opera excerpt on regular symphony orchestra auditions. It's one of the few opera excerpts you're going to do. So uh, tell us a little bit about this excerpt, John, and about Otello in general. Oh yeah, Otello is a great piece to play. Um, just a couple of technical things before we get you know involved in this. Uh, there's always a thing um, about you know playing an accent on the first note or not. So to me, let's just leave that for now. It's a conductor preference. Um, I think if I remember, I generally do that. Um, I think it was Mr. Hurst who told me once. You know, he said, you know, there were probably five bass players with gut strings and. They started the, you know, this, this, you know, the start of Act Four. Nobody heard anything, so Verdi stopped, came down, and screamed and said, "Accent on the first note." I think that was Mr. Hurst, somebody like that. But, but it kind of makes a lot of sense. So I actually think a lot of bass accents come from conductors just not hearing anything. But anyway, that's there. So that's always just, a, you know, just something for, you know, so, you know, especially younger players to always kind of remember. So. Um, Another thing, also, this is you know with mute and without mute. So I've done it, you know, you know different ways. So I played for conductors that wanted the mute. I played for some people that didn't want the mute. So 
you know, sometimes it's just, you know, good just to clear that up in the beginning, so kind of make it a non-issue. So mm-hmm. uh, one thing, if you, are, if you know that you are going to practice this one with the mute, I do recommend that you practice it at home with the mute on. So when you just go and have to play for somebody, when you just put the mute on at the last minute, you know, some of the pitch, you know, always kind of tends to be, you know, a little tiny bit towards the flat side anyway. So I, I, I think that just eliminates that. I've known a lot of people that's kind of thrown them off a little bit. So mm-hmm. just to make sure your pitch is still on, right? Um, just, you know, with this, again, just very smooth string crossings in this. And, uh, you know, really take advantage of the fact that you could be, you know, it's just molto espresso, you know, it's, it's opera, you know. It's, it's just dripping with olive oil here. So, um, <laughs> you know, as much as you can. And, and, and for me, I think you know, playing, you know, you know, bel canto and lyrical and all that. You know, it it doesn't mean that it's you know, it's, you know, expressionism over the end. You know, I mean, it's there's a fine line between doing too much also. So, I mean, I, I always that just comes from watching singers also. So. Um, Another good thing with this is, is to really think with some of the flats. Um, I think we talked about this in, in the orchestra episode. You know, if, if you have to translate some of the flats into, you know, either thinking C, C flat as a B natural, stuff like that, and, and B sharp, you know, and G, G flats as F sharp, that, that kind of helps me out here a lot. Because mm-hmm. um, it's interesting because it's, you know, it's a four flat piece, but so much of it, you know, revolves around you know, the real note B natural, you know, and C flat. So to me, um, B, B natural is very important in this, almost as kind of like this is a mental drone. So, um, you know, the top note you go to is a C flat. That's B natural. So um, so that's kind of interesting. So even though, you know, it starts off with four flats, it's, you know, a lot of it's sort of in, 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 in major also. So a um, couple things just about the Boeing. Um you know, after V, there's always, you know, those portato ways. So it's yum, bum, bum. Um, let's see, I always do up, up, up uh, on all of them except before, right after X to the high C flat. So I, that's for the more advanced players, you know, they probably do that. But um, that, that, that's kind of important. And, and also to make sure there's also, you know, it's there's dots on the note, but for me that's really for the portato, not... I don't think in this excerpt you really want to go, eh, eh, eh. I, I hear bass players do that a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tremendously anticlimactic. I mean, unless the singer's on stage and someone's strangling them. I mean, it's not, it's not going to happen. So. <laughs> and, just, and just another thing towards the end, you know, different conductors do it different ways, but, you know, sometimes there is an accelerando in the, you know, the last part of this. So definitely crescendo, so... In most bass parts, it also has the cello parts. When the cellos come in, when the celli come in, um, yeah, it's just, you know on the end of the third beat, you know, second to last measure. That's the whole rest of the whole orchestra. So, uh, you know, you know, that's when you could really turn it on and just give as much as you can. So, same thing. Just you know, in terms of the, you know, thinking flats to sharps, you know, starting on the bottom line, that's almost kind of like an E major. Yeah, you could think E major scale there. Um, and then, you know, the last three notes, you know, three just full, nice-sounding notes. I've heard so many bass players, you know, put, do so many nice things in this, and then they get to the last three notes, and it's, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing with that. It's just, it's so it's so easy on bass to slip. I mean, the, the instrument presents so many challenges, so it's just constantly overcoming that. So. No, Absolutely. Oh, that's great. Well, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from Verdi's Otello. Thank you. 
right, we have another excerpt for you tonight from Verdi, uh, this time from his opera Rigoletto. And early on in the opera, there's a great, wonderful, lyrical bass solo. It's a bass and cello solo, and it's uh, asked on many auditions, sometimes orchestra auditions, but very frequently on opera auditions. So tell us a little bit about this piece and this excerpt, John. Yeah, Rigoletto. I'm actually playing Rigoletto next week. So, um, wow. Yeah, with uh, Opera New Jersey and uh, like maybe one, the conductor. It's not James Levine, but he's one of the conductors that that conducts at the Met oh, and cool. uh, a lot of great singers. So that should be that should be really cool. Nice. Sorry, I'm forgetting that name, but um, uh, this is also a five flat. Next turn. So you, you see all the accidentals in a lot of these um, opera music also. So um, I think just from a compositional standpoint, you know, they really like the flat keys. Even when you play a lot of musicals and stuff, there's a lot of the, the, the songs and arias are in, you know, D flat and, and G flat major and stuff. So I think it just, it, it, there's a method to that madness, so to speak. Um, just, just right off the bat, this is three P's, so to voce. So, um, but this is the, the big thing with starting this one is, is that it's an octave B flat, so body, body, and you have to skip the D string. So that's very tricky string crossing to start this one out. So that's I, I've talked to a lot of other bass players; they've also kind of you know that's always a kind of a struggle. So um, then again, with this, just in the second measure, not to get too involved with notes, but you know it goes D flat to C flat, you know to B double flat. So <laughs> then again, so just just just. For me, again, just translate into just, you know, if it works, for me, that just works a lot. That may not work for some people, so, yeah, for me, I always want to know, like, what scale system I'm, I'm, I'm in between. That's a, that's a big thing for me and my students, so I'm, I'm, we're always talking about that, so, um, and this one maybe has a tendency to slow down a little bit, I mean, with the the same rhythm over and over again. So mm-hmm. I remember always just kind of having to just kind of keep 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 a flow, keep a tempo going in this one. So and then it's a gradual crescendo, probably one of the longest crescendos you could ever see. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which starts yeah, which starts in the second line and goes all the way to the end to the end to the A flat. So great piece though. Oh, wonderful so, so, piece. So it's a lot more fun to play when you have. 60 other people around you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, here we go with John's recording of this bass solo from Rigoletto. Next up, we have one final piece from Verdi. This time, we're going to be featuring an excerpt from the beginning of the third act of Falstaff. And this is a this is a, quite a contrast to the other two excerpts we've heard from Verdi, which are very lyrical. This is a very uh, much more technical uh, excerpt, and it's it's loads of fun. Actually, when I was playing uh, for a a while, uh, for a season as principal bass of the Des Moines Metro Opera, we did this, and I remember doing this. It was just one other bass player, and you know the you've really the tension's right on you at that point. It's quite an interesting excerpt. So tell us a little bit about this excerpt, John, and about uh, just playing Falstaff. Well, this you know with this excerpt, you just have you know a bouncing bow, mm-hmm. you know whether whether it's on the string or not. I think this one sort of it, it's kind of close to being in between. Um, I can't really remember how, how much I'm really totally on, you know, the, what the exact articulation I'm using here. I mean, it obviously sounds bounced. I mean, but we talked a little bit in the last one, you know, about, you know, with, with some of the faster, you know, the faster tempo, you just have to be, you know, you know, the stick is bouncing, but the hair is on the string. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, this one is just a spaccato exercise. I mean, that's it. So, um, you know, hand, not, your left hand is not really that much of an issue. So I think this is just, this is a real bow exercise. Then again, it's also a crescendo, so 
no stops, Pianis Simone goes to Forte. So the bow exercise here. Yeah, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from Verity's Falstaff. Next up, we've got an excerpt from Carl Maria von Weber, and this is an excerpt from his Irianthe Overture, which uh, is actually a common piece to play on symphonic concerts as well. So even if you haven't played a lot of opera or haven't taken an opera audition, you may know this piece and this excerpt. Uh, tell us a little bit about this excerpt, John. I'm trying to think if I've played this. I can't remember performing this with an orchestra. I'm sure I have. I'm sure I have, but I'm not recalling a performance. But I think this is your standard sort of, you know, three-page overture. So yeah, I remember. Um, I remember doing it with like the, you know, like the South Dakota Symphony or or my all. It's it's one of those, you know, you, you will see it on orchestra concerts. I remember, but it's you know, it's not. It's certainly not as common as the, you know, the Eroica Overture or something like that by Beethoven. Right. Uh, yeah. So. But uh, you know, otherwise, this is just you know, this, this is it's it's pretty quick, and uh, a lot of triplets here, so it's it's triplet land. So mm-hmm. um, again, and I, then again, you know, I just remember you know practicing this, you know, really deciding when I'm going to shift with my first finger is so important. Um, just because you know the end of there's two you know there's two sections to this one also. You know, you play it and it's break, and then some other part in the overture, but um. You know, whenever there's chromatics, I've been doing this more and more with my students. I mean, you know, if you just figure out where you need to put your, you know, your first finger, you know, then do two, four, you know, one, two, four, one, two, two, one, two, four, one, two, four, one, two, four. So you often see people with chromatics, they really just, I'm convinced as bass players, you just figure out where you put, you know, where the first finger goes, you know, all the chromatics come in line. So that's just prevalent in this excerpt. Oh, and then in the second excerpt, yeah, there's an extremely difficult lick at the end. You'll hear it. Triplets, you, you, you'll hear it. So I, I remember that. I just remember that, that just practicing that a lot, it just with string crossings and everything. So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, folks listening to this episode might realize just like a lot of these excerpts we've been hearing so far tonight are are pretty darn difficult, and they're not nearly as familiar as the orchestra literature. So, uh, it's it's really it's it's like a whole undiscovered world for a lot of people. Some of the some of these excerpts. So. Well, here we go with this excerpt from Weber's Irianthe Overture. <laughs> Step, we are moving back into the classical era with some music from Mozart. We're going to be uh, hearing an excerpt from Mozart's Magic Flute. And why don't you tell us a little about playing this, John? We, we talked about some Mozart on the orchestra excerpt breakdown, too. But now we're getting into his opera music, which is somewhat of a different story. Uh, tell us a little bit about this piece and this excerpt, John. Well, this one's from um, yeah, the Magic Flute Overture. So, you know, in, in orchestras, you know, you play that also. So, mm-hmm. um, I think that this was a little bit more of a standard, you know, orchestra piece, maybe, you know, back a couple of decades or so. Um, I do think uh, that on um, bass auditions, they used to hear this much more, uh, you could ask Mr. Hurst that again, maybe like in the 60s and 70s. I think this is a little bit more of a prevalent bass excerpt than these. I mean, every once in a while, you know, it pops up. I remember my freshman year when I first learned this, it was for our, you know, my first orchestra audition at Indiana, my freshman year. So I remember that. So one of my first, I think this is what I did my first lesson. So 
Um, anyway, um, yeah, we did talk about well, uh, the other one we did most of 35 and 39, I think. Um, uh, now, in this overture, um, we have a, a lot of quick, you know, sort of turns. You know, a lot of a lot of really quick hand movements and stuff. And uh, this, you know, then again, it's just you know, it's Mozart. So, you know, Mozart's on Michelangelo. So it just it, to me, it just takes Mozart. Just takes you know everything you have as a musician. So better or for worse, still may not be enough. Probably never enough. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mozart, you know, just being Mozart. But um, you know, for every instrument, you know, it's you know probably the most difficult to come across, I think, just because just it's Mozart. So, uh, in, in this, I remember this, almost this whole overture is probably kind of fair game as far as auditions go, and this this is a perfect example of, you know, sight reading in an audition, too. I could see how this would be perfect, so, because it's sort of barely recognizable, even though I don't know what really the trends are with that. I mean, I mean, technically, there's no such thing as sight reading, but... Um, and I know the next one just starts off, you know, with, you know, on C and, and almost kind of like a C minor feel to it. So, um, yeah, so there it is. Yeah, this is an excerpt that's uh, a lot of bass players when they first encounter it, just trying to keep an even bow stroke for this this excerpt. Um, it just it doesn't work out evenly under the bow when you have this slurred in these separate notes. And so you hear how well John navigates this. It's it's really quite challenging. If you haven't played this piece before, uh, you may be in for a surprise just with... Well, I, I, yeah, actually, Jason, yeah, I do remember one technical thing that could help. Um, when you go into this, you know, after the slurs, because the slurs become on the fourth beat, da 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 that's one bow, uh, the, the first beat of the measures after that, you could do two ups. Mm-hmm. So that helps a lot. So that, that, like, that gets you back on track. I, I think that throws a lot of people off. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Up, up, down, and then you get back on. So constantly, in those two ups, you know, can make can make a, a a world of a difference. So. And I'm sure I'm sure that's what you that's what you did for this uh, recording. Yeah, definitely. That you put definitely. In. All right, great. Well, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from the Magic Flute. Next up, we have another excerpt from Mozart. This time, it's from Linozzi di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro. Wonderful opera, just a great comic masterpiece, uh, like everything Mozart wrote. Uh, so tell us a little bit about this excerpt, John. Well, I do remember that this took a long time to sound decent. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. <laughs> so, um, but that's the wonderful challenge of all this stuff. Now, yeah, so... At, well, as we were talking about in uh, the Magic Flute, you know, that was a lot of sort of spiccato bow. and I mean, there's tons in the rest of the opera of this Mozart, but for this one, this is, um, you know, pretty much a, a, a measure, you know, to one bow. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's 4-4. Four, four. It's pretty quick. Four, four. Actually, it's, you know, it's written in 4-4, four, four, but it's basically in two. So, um, you know, it starts off with some quarter notes, you know, then slurred. So this is really, you know, a, a bow per measure. And with this, I remember, you know, talking of, you know, I, I went to some of my, you know, really good violin friends and, and tried to get some violin techniques for this. Um, and I remember him just showing me, you know, you know really quick shifts and just, it, it sounds really easy, but just having every finger on the note, you know, when you can, if that, if that makes any sense, especially if it's on another string or something. 
it's amazing when you see violinists play real fast. You know, their left hands are so efficient, you know. And it's interesting. Even violinists say that Mozart is the most challenging music they're going to play. You know, I mean, it's interesting because I think to audience members, a lot of the time, Mozart, it, it's just, it's so perfect and in a way almost transparent, you know, in a lot of it that I think a lot of audience members are surprised when they find out how how challenging it really is to do. And, and it could be so boring, too. Yeah, right. That's for I sure. remember seeing a lot of professional orchestras. It's like, because I, I, I think it has to do with just sort of, you know, everything has to be in the pot with this, with, you know, as part of the, as part of the soup, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, if everything's there, I mean, if you, you know, if it's not enough seasoning or something, it's just, um, and, and I love seeing, then again, I love seeing Vienna, those guys play, uh, Mozart, you know? I mean, I mean, you know, we always, you know, I guess we always, you know, we, you know, we had a conception here that Mozart's, you know, a real light composer, but I've never, I went and saw an old Mozart program with Vienna Philharmonic at Carnegie Hall, and wow, they were just, you know, maybe it was, it was, you know, more smooth than, you know, than other stuff, but wow, they were just, just so much sound they were getting from it, it was just amazing. Yeah, what an ensemble to see play Mozart, boy. <laughs> but, and, and then to remember uh, that Mozart, everything Mozart wrote was an opera, that's, you know, people tend to forget that, you know. Absolutely. You know, I think as uh, symphonic players forget that a lot, but if you look at his output, the symphonies are almost an afterthought compared to the operas. That's the core of his output. Yeah, or, or, or even a, a flute sonata. You listen to it, it's like, wow, you could just put people on stage and they could just start walking around. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so. Oh, great. Well, here we go with John's recording of yeah, this excerpt from The Marriage of Figaro. <laughs> Well, we're going to move on to Beethoven, uh, a titan of the symphonic literature. Not much in the opera output, but what he did do is extremely well-known. Uh, Fidelio, which is what we're going to be hearing some excerpts from today. Now, John recorded uh, this excerpt from Fidelio, and why don't you tell us a little bit about Fidelio and about playing Beethoven's opera literature, John? Well, this is another one that I've never gotten to play for real yet, so... Um... I remember, I, you know, you pl- I've played the overture a bunch of times. That, that's pretty prevalent on an orchestra concert. Mm-hmm. Um, supposedly, again, this is a very difficult opera. I mean, I've spoken to some friends of mine that... Um, I remember they played it in Pittsburgh. That was before I was playing with the opera, but wow, you know. They just, people were just saying, wow. I mean, it really amazing. I mean, they really, really loved it, but wow, I mean, it just really... I mean, you know, one tidbit I remember about Fidelio was that, you know, Beethoven really, I mean, he was sort of a composer that struggled to compose. I mean, he wasn't the most, you know, mm-hmm. you see it, when, you know, he'll have 20 sketches of a theme until he gets, you know, where he wants to be. And, and he really, really struggled with, you know, getting to an opera. And he felt so much pressure on, you know, to, 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 to write. I think this is, this is his only opera, right? I think if I'm... Yeah, I believe so. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and in those days, you know, we, we tend to forget these days, but, I mean, the op, you know, when you finally wrote your opera, that was like your, that's when you finally, you know, because he can finally go to Haydn and say, hey, look, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I really did it. So, we tend to forget that these days, but, I mean, opera was the central element, you know, in European culture, I mean, period. Well, you know, a great example of, of Beethoven and his how he just rewrote everything is you just look at the overture for this, and uh, there are, you know, there's the Fidelio overture, and then there are three different uh, Leonore overtures, which are for this as well. And um, just looking at how how dissatisfied he was with a product, he just kept working at it until, and with his sketchbooks, you see that, and with his opera, you definitely see that. Yeah, and I remember a quote I read about Verdi talking about Beethoven with in terms of his vocal writing. But there was a lot. There was a lot of it that he that he really, really loved. But it's interesting. He thought he that Beethoven just stretched the, the range of the singers too much. You know, the sopranos are too high, the basses are too 
well. Mm-hmm. Kind of interesting. And this one's just, you know, this is a pretty pretty quick one. It's just, you know, it's deceptively difficult, seems to be the term. But And also with this, there's a three-measure rest between uh, both sections. Uh, we had to kind of just put, you know, they're on two separate tracks, so if it's more than three measures, please forgive, please forgive me. <laughs> All right, here we go with John's recording of this excerpt from Fidelio. going to wrap up this episode today with an excerpt from Engelbert Humperdinck. And this is an excerpt from Hansel and Gretel, his opera, which is a wonderful opera. And this is a wonderful excerpt that you actually do see on quite a few orchestra concerts. I'm sure you've played this in an orchestral setting before, John, haven't you? I, I, I think so. I, I can't. I remember playing it, but I, I can't remember the specific concert. Well, tell us a little bit about this excerpt and what it's like to work on this and play this. Well, this, this one was kind of a this was kind of a fun excerpt to play. Um, for me, it's this, this, this one. For this one, it's probably more character than anything else. I mean, just from you know, technically, um, you know, it's n- nothing nearly you know as the Strauss and and the Wagner and all that, but uh, for me, this one, character's probably really important, and uh, just the one tricky thing with this is, the, is is getting these bowings to work, the sort of, the, the, you know, the slur two separate two. Um, it's not, this, this one, I remember, you know, it was just kind of a lot of fun. Once you kind of got to know it, it just, you know, it's one you could just kind of, kind of just play and not worry about it as much as you know, some of the other material. Yeah, I, I, this is a really fun excerpt to play, I think. I've, I've prepared this for some concerts before and for an audition or two before, and I, I have a great time with it as well. String cross, you know, smooth string crossings for bass. I think for some reason it's easy for that not to be prior, prioritized. You know, we always think, you know, obviously play, you know, you know, good intonation, good rhythm, and all that. But so many times on bass, I hear like our, our string crossing. You know, so it just because this one just starts up, be up, it just starts out. You know, with a you know slurred string crossing. So I just think with bass and bows, it's just you know we talked about so much how you know how much you have to we have to practice with the bow and you know do all our bowing variations and stuff. And then also you know just 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 those slurred you know playing like a you know slurring you know string crossing. Also, you know, as an exercise, just G D G D G stuff, stuff like that. So, so important. Yeah, and this is this excerpt is a great example of why you need to practice that sort of stuff. Here we go with this recording of John playing this excerpt from Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> Well, that does it for the orchestra excerpts for this episode, and we, but we are going to talk about playing a solo for opera auditions. And here in the United States, the most commonly requested solo by far are the berets from the third Bach cello suite. And we have a recording of John performing this, and this is a piece that every bass player, whether they take an orchestra audition or not, will almost certainly work on. It's one of the most common bass solos, and it's something that everybody should really know on the bass in this day and age. So uh, tell us, John, what, uh, just about pr- the preparation process on this. And, and you know, we're going, to, we're going to not get too d- in-depth here on this episode, but at some point in the future, we are going to do actually an episode just dedicated to these 
movements, the berets from the third cello suite by Bach, because it's such a crucial part of being a bass player. It's so critical to taking auditions and just your musical development in general. So tell us a little bit about these berets, John, and preparing them for an orchestra audition and just preparing them in general. Yeah, and, and, you know, just as you said, you know, we're going to do, you know, a whole sort of, you know, mini episode just, you know, focusing on the berets, you know. So what I'll do for now is I'll leave out, you know, fingerings and bowings and just kind of talk about kind of like an overall, um, you know, approach. Um, well, one thing I've always done with the berets is that, you know, when we play so many, you know, this, you know, so many difficult passages and so many things with so many sharps and flats and, you know, difficult string crossings and, you know, crazy, you know, all that stuff. Um, well, I think what I did is I kind of used the berets, you know, since we always kind of know them so well. It's kind of like, you know, a great warm-up also. So, um, you know, to me, there's nothing like, you know, when you start with Bach, it's like, you know, getting up in the morning and, like, you know, having your, you know, a banana and some freshly squeezed juice or something. I don't know, it just kind of mm-hmm. gets the day off right. So um, I just remember, you know, you know, it's, it's not really a technical thing, but, you know, for me, you know, it's always something that kind of like, you know, you play through the box a couple of times, you know, it's, it's awesome warm up, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, basically, you know, one thing about the box, we'll certainly talk about this more, in the, you know, when we do our you know, in-depth version, but, um, you know, it's picking the right addition also. So um, I know a lot of bass players start with the Sterling. Uh, I think I started with that when I was in high school when I first started playing these. Um, uh, which is fine. Um, the big pitfall in general to me with this is that um, since we, you know, we start reading from a cello part and stuff, is that we tend to play a lot of, you know, that we play a part that, you know, has a lot of slurs, and you know, the bowings always seem to be, you know, you know, if you're reading cello bowings, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, first of all, the good thing about using the Sterling is that it's written in G major, so that's good. So. Um, I've always just you know transposed this for so long. So um, the the book the book that I have now is I play from the um, Baron Rider. Mm-hmm. You could buy the Baron Rider cello suites. Um, they're, they're not they're not too expensive. Um, Sixty uh, sixteen ninety nine. Here I think I bought these in October of nineteen ninety seven. So obviously it's a while ago. But anyway, for me, um, you know, just just make sure that. You know, you have the bowings you want to do is so important. I, I think what happens is that the bass players practice this without having a bowing plan or pattern. So, and that's, you all know, you know, you change the bowing, you change the left hand. So, mm-hmm. um, other than that, you know, just, just a quick, um, you know, basically, so this is, you know, part of the third suite. Um, we play it in G major. Um, just as far as auditions go, you know, sometimes you can play the repeats. You know, sometimes they don't let you play the repeats. So, whenever I was able to play repeats, I like that because it's a second chance. So, mm-hmm. if you feel like, you know, something didn't go right, then you do that. So, uh, Otherwise, you know, there's always Beret 1 and Beret 2. So, I, I had one of my, you know, students, he, he's, a, he's a high school student, and he, uh, you know, had to play this for one of his, um, you know, sort of district, you know, all-county orchestra type things, and it just said Beret from the third tweet. So, you know, you always have to make sure you classify what that means. Sometimes that does mean both of them. So, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, and, and Beret too, you know, it starts off piano and it's, you know, it's slurred. So that's, that's sort of the slurred piano, you know, a little bit more expressive one uh, compared to the, the first Beret. But, you know, we'll, we'll get much more in depth in terms of fingerings and bowings. And, you know, if I can, you know, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll put my, you know, we'll try to put my audition up there that doesn't violate any copyrights or anything. Yeah, that's great, John. You know, it is, this is, like John was saying, this is just, this is something that every bass player is going to work on most likely in their, in their bass playing career. And so it's a something. standard repertoire, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just like Beethoven 9 and all that stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to hear John's recording of the Berets. And we're going to close out the episode with this. So I'd just like to thank John for agreeing to be on the program, for doing this great opera excerpt episode. You know, this is really uh, something that hasn't been done before on any instrument. What we're doing here with both the orchestral excerpt breakdown and the opera excerpts. And the the orchestral excerpt breakdown has been downloaded uh, over a thousand times already. And by the time you're listening to this, it might be several thousand. So... 
it's wow. really touching a lot of bass players out there. And we hope that this opera excerpt w- episode will get out there and both help people learn a little bit more about opera excerpts and uh, maybe encourage them to check out some of this music and start to work on it and just kind of learn about this rich repertoire. So thanks so much, John. Check out John at classicalmusicnews.tv. Thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to do this tonight. Absolutely. Here we go with John's recording of the Bach Berets from the third cello suite. That was our opera excerpt breakdown. Similar format, right, to the orchestra excerpts. Again, lots of people have written in over the years, and I love seeing these comments a decade later, right? Oh, wow, I just discovered this. This was so helpful. I was preparing for an opera audition. I felt overwhelmed. I didn't know these licks. I Googled it, and hey, I found this, and I love it. Thank you so much. And what's not to like about that? Fantastic feedback. We followed up this opera excerpt breakdown with an episode talking about the differences between orchestra and opera playing. So we're going to play this. It's a little under a half hour conversation between John and myself about that. I think it works well in the context of this episode was turning out to be a mammoth episode. Thank you. You made it to this point. You're a real hardcore bass geek insider. So uh, welcome to the club. And we'll finish off today's episode with this conversation about the differences. Well, we're here today with double bassist John Grillo. Now, John is a frequent collaborator here on Contrabass Conversations, and he also authors his own blog at classicalmusicnews.tv. How's it going, John? Hey, Jason. I'm great. How are you tonight? Oh, I'm doing great. And, you know, John and I have completed a couple of episodes recently on breaking down orchestra excerpts and opera excerpts. And we thought we'd just put out an episode just chatting a little more generally about opera playing as a bass player and how it contrasts with orchestra playing. You know, for our opera episode, we're very keeping it very specific to the pieces and the composers and the styles. And so I thought it'd be good to just put out an episode where we chatted just a little more generally about what it's like in the life as an operatic bass player. So, uh, 
John, th- just talk a little bit about some of the differences that someone's going to run into who's used to playing an orchestra environment. What are they going to find in an opera setting? Well, the first thing, I, you know, was, I don't know if it's obvious or not, but it's just, you know, the, the length of time that you're playing yeah. is really such a difference. I mean, I remember we played uh, Verity's Macbeth. This is when I was, I was, I was principal bass at the Sarasota Opera. And I'll never forget, you know, walking back into Act 4, and I, you know, it was something like 10 to 11, or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it's, and then, you know, not just time-wise, you know, with different stage things and stuff, but, I mean, it's definitely a longer concentration period by far, I think. So, you, you know, you, you have the first half of a symphony concert. You know, if you have an overture, okay, so that's, what, six, seven minutes? You know, then you play a piano concerto, that's, you know, at, you know, say if it's even a half hour, that's still almost, what, 40, that's not even 45 minutes of music, so. But, you know, just for starters, you know, what I really, what I'm just enamored with, with the whole world of opera is that, for some reason, I really like the first rehearsal. I mean, if you really think about what goes into putting in, in, in you know, an operatic production on, it's almost just sort of mind-boggling. And it really blew me away once. Is I, I met a lady who was a subscriber to the uh, to one of the operas I was playing in, and you know, I asked her once. I was like, you know, so why? You know, what? what I don't know why I asked her. You know, what what made you want to be a subscriber? I remember she said, she said, I can't believe that this even happens. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said. But I never forgot that. I was just sitting in an airport too. I don't know, just talking to someone, they're waiting for a flight. You know, I never forgot that because. Well, you know, there's many ways we can go with this discussion, but ba- basically, the ama- you know, is that I think in the U.S. we've really, you know, opera was definitely not grounded here, as far as the symphony. I mean, when you know, in 1900, so there, there's many reasons for that. You know, you know, one, you know, opera lately, really since the three tenors, you know, has been kind of, you know, taking off. You know, Pavarotti has done a lot for that. But you know, if you think about opera, you know, you know, maybe. You know, in case for, you know, just a couple houses, like maybe like the Met or something. I mean, it's really sort of a recent phenomenon. Oh, yeah. And there's many reasons for that. I mean, it's it's really hard to pin down. But one thing that somebody told me was that, um, you know, when you go back to like the late 18th centuries, you know, when this, you know, when in Europe, you know, opera's hitting its peak, um, you know, the theater was kind of an undesirable place, uh, in the United States, as far as, you know, from a sort of a puritanical standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, even, even a, you know, a woman on stage, I mean, you couldn't even show like a piece of skin or yeah, <laughs> probably a woman on stage, you wouldn't even want that. Uh, you know, same thing, sort of like the temperance movement. I mean, sort of that time in, in the United States, you know, you know, mar- legislating morality was just like a really, really big deal. So, um, and I guess we had the vaudeville culture too, that kind of, you know, took some space from this, uh, but, uh, you know, it never really, you know, as, and what was an amazing experience for me once is when the first time I got to go to Vienna, you know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to see the, you know, the music for Rhyme. And I remember when I went to Vienna, I, I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I went down to the area of town, and, and you know, and in, in the American mindset, that's us. Like, we always think like Symphony Hall, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, in Chicago, you know, you live in Chicago. The first time I went to Chicago, you know, Orchestra Hall, and it was like, that's part of our culture, I guess. But, I mean, we, we tend to forget that, you know, opera for hundreds of years from the Renaissance, you know, starting in Florence, you know, was the thing. And, and symphony, you know, is basically kind of an out, you know, it's an out, the symphony orchestra is an outgrowth from the opera pit, I mean, by its organic nature. So it's just interesting here in America now, we're kind of like opera, it's really taking off in so many ways, but it should. It's kind of an interesting discussion. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. It's very interesting to watch. I, I see, I've noticed for a while that a lot of the symphonic concerts I play seem to be losing audience members every year. And the, a lot of the opera companies I play with, I look out in the theater, and they seem to be gaining, or certainly not losing. And so it does seem to be gaining momentum. It's one of those areas of the classical music world. Now, for bass players out there, uh, you know, you, aside from maybe the occasional opera at your university, you, you don't probably do very much opera until you get into the professional world. So what, what's a bass player going to be running into... Uh, just, just, what are some things that they could do to sort of prepare themselves for playing? 
Well, especially, I mean, I, I think especially if someone's, you know, if, if someone happens to jump into having to play principal, and, uh, and, and, don't, and I think with opera, that'll probably happen, you know, almost, you know, usually sometimes opera things are just kind of, you know, like a summer festival or something like that. But, I mean, so much, you know, as far as for bass, um, when I've played principal in opera, I mean, the, you, you are like the metronome of the group. I mean, yeah. the, all of the rhythm comes down on the shoulders of the principal bass player. Mm-hmm. And to me, I thought that was, when I had to do that, was just, it, it's an amazing responsibility. I mean, <laughs> because if, if you internalize that, I mean, I remember one day leaving rehearsal, I was exhausted. We had six hours of rehearsal and I was just, wow, and... You know, and the whole time the conductor looks right at you and a bum, 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 bum. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh-huh. And, and first of all, the singers are always off anyway. So, <laughs> you know, so they always drag. I mean, most of the times in operas, it's not really, you know, a straight tempo anyway, so mm-hmm. it shouldn't be. Right. So, um, you know, it's number one. So, you know, whether you're principal or not, because probably, you know, irrelevant, because the section, then you just have to deal with the principal. I mean, there has to be consensus as far as tempo goes. Mm-hmm. Or the conductor will just, and, and I think you know, conductors they really lean on the bass, and they really lean on it. Because I think you know, I mean, in, in, in a symphonic setting, you know, bass is important for rhythm, but you know, you, the percussion has such a bigger role. I think. I mean, obviously, you know, bass is rhythm. You know, you play the beat or whatever. But I mean, in opera, it's it's really the crutch. I mean, it's really it's it's laying on your shoulders. So that's a that's a pretty big responsibility to me. Mm-hmm. But the flip side of that, okay, there's the challenge, but the opportunity is that, you know, I mean, what, what, what a rush, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, in some ways, it's, you have a huge responsibility, but wow, I mean, what, a, what an awesome responsibility, my God. <laughs> I don't know if I just sort of, like, make a fantasy out of it, but wow, I mean, this whole opera, like, you're really, you know, really part of it, you know? I mean, that, that's really cool. And, and as far as learning the... um. You know, the repertoire, you know, it's just like, you know, the opera episode we did. I mean, so many times in opera, it's, it's completely new, rep, new material. So, you know, definitely, you know, you have to learn the music and, and go through the music. And, you know, and sometimes the music's not easy to read. Some, some of those old Italian editions and, you know, especially the French. Uh, I mean, when I did Pelleas, not Pelleas and Melisande, Pearl Fishers. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes those French parts are, like, illegible. <laughs> I mean, you know, so, you know, because they, they, they and they have different things for you know with rests and mm-hmm. the French rest and stuff. So you know, it's pretty difficult. I mean, you know, it's it's not easy. So yeah, you know, one thing that I've sort of found that is interesting in opera, and I've had other bass players tell me this is that you know, so much of opera is it's so it's just so much more flexible in the time than than uh, symphonic literature and just trying to follow the conductor who's anticipating the singers is just such a challenge and then in opera it seems like I have a bass player colleague that has told me this line before and I really like it he said in opera things are always slowing or they're speeding up it's it, it, you just get into a groove and then it changes and that is something that I think in the pit and with the sound bouncing around is something that really takes some getting used to for bass players. Absolutely. I, I can't agree with that more. And, and it's easy to say that there's no tempo, but yeah, I, I like, I think what you're saying kind of implies that it's like, it's a constantly fluctuating tempo. Mm-hmm. You know, except for maybe for overtures or something. And yeah, but you know, on the flip side of that, that makes, that, that adds to, to a such more sort of engaging experience, I think. I mean, and then, you know, the other thing of the modern age, um, I played in the master class for uh, uh, Yane Saxola, who for a period of time was the principal bass of the Berlin Philharmonic. And I remember, you know, I started playing for him up there, and, uh, you know, it was a big master class, you know, there's tons of people in the audience and everything. And, and we stopped, and the first thing he said to me was, he's like, he's like, John, he's like, He's like, do you know that every beat, you know, is the same? Like, it comes the same time after the one before it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it, and it, and it kind of, it kind of threw the whole, it kind of threw the whole place on its head because here we are. So much of the sort of American sort of audition practice, you know, it's just have the rhythm be exactly the same and. 
you know, playing with the metronome all the time. And I'm sure at that at that point in my life, I was, you know, really hyper doing that, like like a madman. You mm-hmm. know, I was basically sleeping with Doctor Beat under my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that kind of threw everything over the head. I mean, and the older I got, you know, I've never forgotten that. And I think. You know, there's something to that because, you know, even when you have some opera, you know, the the interesting thing is to see an opera orchestra play a, uh, you know, a regular symphonic piece. Mm-hmm. Because it's it's so different. It's such a, it's such a drama. I mean, it's, you know, one time in New York, I saw the, uh, the Dresden Staatskapelle play the concert in Carnegie Hall. It was one of the best concerts I've ever seen. It was an all Strauss concert. So they played on Heldenleib and then they played on Juan and they... Now, as, a, as an encore, they had a Wagner concert the night before. They played Rienzi Overture as an encore. Wow. <laughs> it took like 20 minutes or something. It was so dramatic. But <laughs> Well, and you know, this. <clears throat> just thinking about doing this, you know, this episode tonight, you know, it's kind of a crazy word for music school, but it's so important. You know, there's that, you know, that German term of Gunsamkunstwer, mm-hmm. you know, which, 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 means, which means total work of art. And it really is. So, I mean, so when you have opera, what you have is this stuff. You have the culmination of, you know, of all the arts. I mean, maybe not the digital arts like we have today with new media and stuff, but, I mean, of those, you know, so there's, it's the culmination. So you have theater, so you have music, you have orchestra, mm-hmm. and you have singing. Mm-hmm. And basically, and, and, you know, and just the word opera in, in, you know, in Italian is just... It just means like artwork. It's interesting. I mean, like I remember I was, you know, in Italy. You go into a church to look at, you know, paintings and statues, and it'll just say, you know, opere, you know, like op- opera works. It's kind of like, wow. So it's just interesting. I mean, basically, in our country, we just for some, you know, we've missed a boat with opera as far as being intertwined. We're having sort of a renaissance now, but it's just another, you know, interesting conversation I have with there's a friend of mine. His name was Hans Peter. Ochsenhofer, he's a <laughs> viola player in the Vienna Philharmonic. This guy's a real trip. But uh, he was, I think, a principal there in Vienna, and just tell, telling us how much opera they would play, you know. And, and again, you know, we would always talk about symphony, and the Vienna Philharmonic guys would kind of stop and be like, you know, we're just like... I remember one time one of the guys asked me, like, why do you always ask about the Vienna Philharmonic? That's what the guy said. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, talking about recordings and stuff. You know, and then one of his friends was like, "He's like, we play opera every night." You know, wow. And in, and in Vienna, they play an opera every night from September first until June first, except for like Christmas Day and Easter. Wow. Every every single night in Vienna. So then you have the Vienna Philharmonic, which is really kind of like it's a social club. <laughs> used to be it used to be a men's club. I mean, it's a club. I think they practice, you know, every, you know, two, you know, two weeks or something. They get together to play some Mozart. It's like, just kind of an interesting. There it is again. The difference, you know, between sort of the American mindset and, and it's the opera. It's the Vienna State Opera. That's that. That's the state. At least in Vienna, that's the state funding opera house. And the and the Vienna guys said, you know, the orchestras like they do, you know, fundraising and they have donors and all that kind of stuff, which is kind of interesting. That's extremely interesting because here in the states, you, you think the exact opposite. I mean, you think Vienna Philharmonic. And then they just back to what I was saying before. I was walking around Vienna. I couldn't find that. And then you know, the second biggest structure in Vienna is the is the State Opera House. I mean, it's it's what it's a gorgeous building. I mean, after the cathedral, it's the second largest architectural structure. So I mean, so you go there and you experience that, and then you know you remember back to you know reading about music history. You know, with Haydn and the opera and Mozart and you know, you, you have Haydn, you know, he sees Mozart's first opera, and he never composes an opera ever again, I think. It's interesting. Just got out of it completely. But anyway, just back to how it affects space, yeah, tempo is definitely... And, and I think effort's important. I remember once I made, you know, I came in wrong, in the wrong spot, but thinking you know, principal bass, you know, the intermission was really, like, supportive in a lot of ways. It's interesting, you know? Mm-hmm. And because it's like an opera, that's just, it's, it's, bound, it's bound to happen, you know? So it's different. So uh, I think what I'm trying to say is that, you know, in opera, you have to go along and you have to play the music and like, okay, so you miss, you know, the page, you know, the pa- you know, you have to go and turn the page and the lights on. And, you know, there's so much more. So there's a, 
it's such a big margin of error, you know. Well, yeah. If you have if you have an opera that's four, five, six hours, and you have an orchestra concert that's a lot shorter, and the opera also, every your your focus has to be so much greater for such a longer period of time, and the tempos are so much more fluctuating. It's almost inevitable that mistakes are going to happen. It's so, it's so different than the on stage mentality, I think, in that way at least, because yeah, it's, it's the odds are just so much greater that you know, and, and with the flexibility plus the amount of time you're down there playing, it's it's just a very different scene. And, and just you know, just, you know, just in case we have some younger people that you know never play, ever played an opera. I mean, just, we should just talk about the basic construction as far as the orchestra goes. Um, mm-hmm. You do have, and in professional situations, it's short. I mean, it could be just two or three, but there's always just orchestra rehearsals beforehand, mm-hmm. which is important. Which really, in opera world, they call readings like orchestra readings. And then, then you go from the reading stage. You maybe have two or three of those in a professional setting. And remember, you're getting through probably 100 pages of music in three rehearsals, which is yeah. pretty awesome. So um, uh, so there's a certain pace to that. There's a certain pace to opera preparation. I think that's one thing that I like a lot. It's like it, ha- it demands efficiency, so, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Um, and then second, then you have the Sitz Pro. You get all these wonderful names that mm-hmm. come from Europe. Or... You know, if you have a crazy Italian conductor, they call it Italiana, which fits Pearl and Italiana, it's the same thing. So that's basically the rehearsal where the singers come in, mm-hmm. which which I always think is kind of fun, because you get to just kind of sit, you know, right next to somebody just screaming, you know, <laughs> as loud as they can, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and then again, that's a big accomplishment. And then when you go from that, you know, point, you know, maybe you have one or two dress rehearsals. It's It's that famous expression, you know, the show must go on. I mean, if a certain section of the orchestra is not sounding good in the spot or the chorus is always late. You know, I mean, it's, you just have to do it. So, I mean, there's an interesting sort of survival survival attitude when it comes to opera performance. So, <laughs> don't sweat it. If you make a little tiny mistake, I mean, it's the chorus could, like, fall or something. So, I mean, but that's an interesting progression. But, um, so, you know, you do have a lot of music to learn. That that is that is an important. So you know, if you're a young person out there, hopefully in music in your music school, you'll at least play one opera. And even if it's not you know Verdi or Puccini opera, you could also you know you know sometimes you know you know a, a good musical will be sort of the same experience. So mm-hmm. anything where you're just in a pit. I mean, when you're in a pit, it's just that's kind of a different scenario. You know what you mentioned about the, the just ha- the efficiency that it demands. I mean, that's one of those things that I realized when I started playing opera too. Is like I realized, wow, we have more music to cover. You know, you'd have X amount of music that you're going to do in a rehearsal, and the length of that music was greater than the length of the rehearsal. And that's something that you don't find a lot in orchestra music. But you know, you're going to do, you're going to cover acts one and two of Rosenkavalier. Well, that's that's you know that's. That's pushing the length of the actual rehearsal, even if you just played through it. And so that's so different than if you're trying to prepare, uh, you know, an hour and a half of music at the most for an orchestra concert, and you have a two and a half or three hour rehearsal to do it. It's it's a very different preparation process. And I, w- I wonder, I wonder if you have any advice for folks out there just on. And how to keep that amount of music under your fingers? You know, we were talking about some of these operas that are pushing four, five, six hours. What do you do when you're playing opera to warm up and to just keep those licks under the fingers? What sort of process do you have? Well, you know, it really comes down to you know that that you know that the uh, you know when you're first a young musician and you know that your teacher always tells you to always have a pencil. I mean, if you see how much people in opera pits you know use to you know make notes, that's that's so important. So, you know, not just sort of, you know, up bow, down bow, you know, you get way beyond that. So, um, you know, people usually use a swiggly, uh, you know, uh, you know, swiggly line. So, you know, a really important thing in opera is, is how you, you know, is what you write into the page is, as mental cues to remember. So, you know, since we, you know, there's so many of those tempo fluctuations we talk about, about, you know, a lot of professional musicians, you know, use arrows, you know, an arrow to the right, you know, it's different because, you know, rehearsals are going along so much. I don't think I could write in, you know, A, C, C, you know, E, L with a period. Right. I mean, you're already on the next page. So to me, that the most important thing is when you have a tempo slowdown, you know, would be those accelerandos, you know, um, 
uh, you know, the Ritadendos, you know, when it slows down. And then probably the two most important symbols, there's probably more, but just what I'm thinking now is a squiggly line. And, and that, that's sort of like, it's not even a Ritadendo, like the singers is kind of doing their own tempo, you know? And mm-hmm. then that's sort of when you have to stop. And then the biggest thing is the railroad tracks. Mm-hmm. It's so important. Because in so much in opera, and we're not used to that in symphony. You know, in symphony, I guess sometimes maybe we have a grand pause or a sonata or something. But in opera, you would have these, these, these total stoppages. It stops. <laughs> and you'll learn that fast. <laughs> you know, and, and there's this sort of seasoning to that when you're kind of a seasoned, you know. And, and it, and it kind of grows. It, it kind of grows organically throughout the process. So, I mean, really good notes is really important, I think. Um. You know, fingerings. Uh, uh, you know, don't don't hesitate. You know, if something's really crazy. You know, just right into fingering and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. um, and you know, especially as far as as bass playing goes, is that you get to play some really great like bass soli material. Mm-hmm. You know, it's maybe not as elaborate as you know Otello or anything like that, but. I mean, even a couple of years ago, I was playing Pagliacci, and wow, the whole, the whole act ends with like, I think it was almost kind of like 20 measures or so, just the bass section, and something on stage. I mean, that was like, now it was nothing really that difficult left-hand-wise and you know, accidental-wise, but wow, our intonation was a real fight. I mean, we did a real good job, but we had to try as hard as we could. <laughs> um you know, we had the first rehearsal, and the conductor yelled at us that it sounded terrible and everything. So <laughs> you'll, you'll you'll get plenty of that. But I mean, I, th- I thought that was kind of cool. I mean, how often do you? Not that many times in a symphony concert does it just you just break? It's just the basses are playing, I and mean, that's kind of cool. Oh yeah. And it really depends on the work. I mean, you know, sometimes there's some wider fare. I mean, stuff like Slater Mouse and that kind of stuff kind of gets kind of you know not that big of a deal. You know, on the flip side is is knowing where to come in becomes really important because sometimes you could have like a really extended breaks, mm-hmm. um, and that's an art in itself. I mean, you could be out, you could be tacit for like you know a pretty long time, and have to be have to be ready to come in. So yeah. I know people. Lo- I mean, know people always love to depend on cues and the principal dates or something. But you know, I would always try to keep you know at least some semblance of knowing where you are. Um, so that, you know that's 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 interesting. That's why we're having this discussion tonight because there's there's so many different you know elements to this. And, and to me, it, it it makes you such a better musician. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just feel that opera always makes you a better musician. I think. So you know what I, I mean, maybe it's just my attitude, but I kind of just I kind of let it. You know, I like that kind of pushing pushing me on different levels. You know. Yeah, definitely. Funny, it seems like a really bashing the symphony, but I mean. Well, it's it's just it's just a different you know it's there there are so many similarities and and playing the symphony is a wonderful thing too obviously as as you and I both know but yeah it, it's definitely it's an interesting skill set and you know one of the one of the members of an opera company here in Chicago uh, the the principal cellist uh, recorded a solo album a few years ago and I listened to it and I was just struck by like how unbelievably lyrical it was and how that obviously came from his decades of experience as an opera player, sitting there listening to those singers, and it just sort of informs you in a different way. I mean, those really are the, the you know, the stars of the world of classical music and art music, and uh, the, the the great opera singers. I mean, that, that in terms of phrasing, and just, th- those are those are just models that are just absolutely without peer. And, and so... Uh, to be constantly exposed to that, in, especially in a top opera company or in, in any level of opera company, too, it, it really can change your musicianship, I, I think. And so it's, it's very interesting. And it's, a, a lot of people find it, it actually much more satisfying than orchestra playing or satisfying in a different way. And for some people, I mean, on the flip side, I mean, after they're in a pit for a while, they just they can't take it any longer. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, definitely. You know, and it's it's you know this this part of playing in an opera orchestra that's it, it could be sort of thankless in a way besides your own personal satisfaction. I mean, I mean it's important and everything, but you know I love the opera performance. You know, that all the singers come out and they do their bows and everything, and you know then the conductor walks out and points to the orchestra and there's like the, the applause and the audience doesn't change a single bit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> 
I always love that. You always kind of have to think of the priorities at that point. Mm-hmm. But obviously that's the focus. So, mm-hmm. And I've known some people that have they've played in opera companies for a while, and they take an orchestra audition, and they, they get out of it, too. So, I mean... Mm-hmm. It's 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 very difficult. So and it, and it, it wears on people after a while too, especially as bass players. I mean, just the physical dexterity of dexterity of it is very. And sometimes you have to play like quarter note stuff for a really long time. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I think that physical aspect it, it can be so taxing, and to be in you know on a stool for that amount of time in fairly close quarters, even no even the you know the. The top opera companies here in the United States, they still are, are generally a lot closer together than the symphony orchestra players. And there, it's it, it, you might not have the kind of mobility and freedom, just a movement even, that you do in orchestra playing. And so to be down in a pit for a much longer period of time on a stool playing sometimes uh, very demanding parts, it, it can be very physically taxing. Yeah, and and there's less bass players usually than a symphony, also. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. But not in the less demand for sound. They still yeah, no, yeah. You <laughs> could have three. You could have three bass players, or maybe four bass players. Mm-hmm. I played a lot, a lot of opera with three. I played a lot with four. I've also played some opera with two. So last summer I played Carmen. We had two bass players. So I mean. Mm-hmm. But then again, that goes back to just kind of it's pushing you to do as much as you can. So I mean, that's nothing wrong with that. And you, you know, and also you know, everybody you know, as far as the bass players, I mean, you know, we all have the, the 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 excerpt books and the complete symphonies of Beethoven and Mozart and everything, and you know, and a lot of this opera music is kind of hard to come by. So, mm-hmm. and then again, just I think the parallel to music school is that since opera is kind of, you know, the the focus of America for so long has been symphonic world. You know, you could see that in the music school. I mean, you know, rarely do you have a bass class and just have. Um, and I think, and in, in, in we had the interview with Mr. Hurst, I mean, we talked a little bit about this, how, you know, when somebody just went to take an audition for George Zell or Fritz Reiner, I mean, they would just take out, you know, uh, Electra or something. I mean, mm-hmm. so as far as being a part of kind of the audition realm, I mean, back in the day, they used to, you know, those old school conductors, they used to want to hear that stuff. That was, you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. Well, John, th- this has really been great get- getting a chance to just discuss some of these issues. You know, this is the sort of st- stuff that w- that I think really helps to kind of s- set a foundation for folks who are getting into opera and bass players, and it's a great compliment to our opera excerpt episode, too. So if you haven't checked that out, please go back to ContrabassConversations.com and, uh, and check out that episode. And, yeah, it's been great just getting into some of these issues with you, John. Very interesting Hey, thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks for having me tonight. Okay, that's going to do it for another episode. Wow, this is a big episode. We're almost up at the three-hour mark. So again, if you've made it this far, congratulations. Boy, is it painful listening back to 10-year-old Jason go through these things. I hope that I've gotten better at just conversing in general over the past decade. Hopefully I have. And... I think, but the content's so great, right? I mean, all these excerpts from orchestra and opera and that conversation, I think it's valuable. And if you found this valuable or you just want to reach out, hey, like, let me know, how are you listening to this mammoth episode? Are you driving across Texas? Are you on a transcontinental flight? I'd love to hear from you. Feedback at ContrabasConversations.com. That'll put you in touch with me. If you're new to the podcast, this is the sort of stuff we've been doing for over a decade, and it's all archived for free at ContrabasConversations.com. Dot com. And if you want to help out the show and help us to do more of these kind of episodes, the number one thing you can do is share this episode. You can share right from your phone. If you're using your phone, don't do this if you're driving, right? you're doing some other activity that it wouldn't be wise to do this, but share this episode. Share it on Facebook or wherever you spend time online. It would be super helpful. You can go to the website, ContrabasConversations.com, share this episode, share anything recent. That would be a wonderful gesture, and it helps to spread the word about this show and get it out to more people. And the more people we have along on this journey, the better. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. John appreciates it. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.